Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Ward, a Doof Media podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss Ward, why those return to the world of parahumans. My name is Matt Freeman, and this is my co-host, Scott Daly. <clears throat> this is my co-host, Scott Daly. What? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. I was just, I was just thinking about showers. Uh, uh, what? Oh, uh, Sorry. Uh, can we start now? Y- yes. This is the weekly podcast where Matt and I eagerly dive into Wild Bo's world of orange dick rocks, sexy sweat licks, and alien-based death powers as we analyze and interpret this ongoing web serial. This week, we conclude Arc 13 Black with 13Z and begin Arc 14 Breaking with 14.1. Matt, it's Sveta interlude time. At last, the final breakthrough interlude we journey into sveta's past as she kind of decides what to do about this whole choice she's been given and uh and it works it works it works yeah and and then victoria does a whole bunch of therapy while uh while imagining banging a dude so Mm -hmm. matt what do you think of these two chapters yeah tremendous tremendous sexual energy coming from these chapters (laughs) um must be due to all of the characters with horns that victoria fought oh they're also the horny last couple of arcs all those guys are so horny it's it's coming it's coming due mm-hmm. um no these, these i mean the sveta interlude i think i think that i said while, while reading it i mean and, and it's true or after reading it i should say that it was probably one of the most emotionally impactful uh chapters of, of any well story like the the level of i think I, I said that i actually had to take a break while reading it because I was just getting too anxious um, at, at the possibilities of what could happen. And I just needed to like bleed off some of that before I kept reading. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the few, I don't know. I'm, I'm someone who I, I get choked up at movies much more easily than I get choked up at books. I don't know why that is exactly, yeah. but this chapter actually got me uh, a couple times. Um, and we'll talk about when exactly, but I, I, maybe people already know what I'm, what I mean. Um, and then, and then the you know the the, the uh, intro to arc fourteen breaking um, is taking things in a very interesting direction, and there's a lot to say there too. Yeah, um, I'm 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 excited because I think these are two <laughs> these are two of my favorite characters, and we have a a very Sveta focused chapter, and then we have a a really really interesting Victoria chapter to start off a new arc on. So I, I completely agree with you. I um, I was you know destroyed emotionally by this this chapter. I think. You know, what gets lost in analysis sometimes is that emotion, yeah. right? And it's like, so I'm probably not going to be like too emotional talking about the chapter today, but I was, I am right there with you about, about how the chapter worked on me emotionally. Um, it yeah. was really effective. Yeah. That's why I wanted to to say it right up front. In fact, right. um, like half of my reason for kind of um, divulging how, how impactful it was kind of in the discord was, was to be like. I am, I'm worried that I'm going to forget because when I go back <laughs> and I do, and I do like the analytical read through where I take notes mm-hmm. that that is a, a fairly sterile experience. Yeah. Um, and I was like, no, 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 I need to really be sure that, that, that I remember and that I talk about the fact that this absolutely got to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. So, um, it might be a little bit sterile of a discussion, but know that, uh, that we were crying. Yes. It's crying. Yes. Real tears. Maybe we'll cry again now. We'll we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, before we move on, uh, quick announcements. Yeah, I'm gonna cry if you guys don't get in your entries for the quarterly fan art contest because it is coming up. The due date is this coming Monday. If you were listening uh, the day this came out, Wednesday the 22nd, you got five days. Uh, Monday the 27th at midnight Pacific time. We're giving you all the way to midnight Pacific time to turn in your uh, fan art for the the sixth quarterly fan art contest sure it's the sixth one sure. um the theme is relationships you can check out the link in the show notes for details on that you still have time even if you haven't started there's still technically time 
because I don't know how long it takes to draw things. <laughs> so it's like 10 minutes, right? Yeah, I mean, that's how long it takes me to draw things. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. me too. Yeah. So yeah, check that out. We're excited about the entries. Um, when we talk next time, we'll have all of our entries in. So that's cool. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, so let's get on into it. Chapter 13.Z. Uh, so, you know, kind of worth pointing out, you know, where, where is 13.Y? Because we went from 13.X, the overseer interlude, to here, 13.Z. Is there shenanigans going on? It usually means something if we mess up the order. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it certainly is a break in the pattern. You're absolutely right. I went back and double checked this just to be sure that um, I'm hesitant to prescribe too much to it because i think we've like overcomplicated the analysis of chapter numbers in the past i think heavens is going to be the the arc that's remembered for over analyzing <laughs> what was going on with the numbers there um, but it is worth bringing up because anytime a pattern is broken it's worth bringing up um i don't know i know we might be doing something we might not i don't know uh, yeah i mean i i wouldn't be surprised if we saw a dot x show up somewhere and have that be a second sveta interlude but yeah i, I don't really know that would be interesting though, because it would be a, it'd be a like a pre. Because I mean, definitely this is the l- least. Um, I guess Chris only got one interlude, right? So mm-hmm. s- so far, I should say. Um, but it seems like most breakthrough members get multiple interludes, right? I mean, uh, up to a whole is arc in true? some cases. Um, I mean, Capricorn got three. Yeah, well, he's special. Um, um, Ashley got like five or seven or something yeah um, kenzie's only gotten one kenzie's only got is that true yeah i guess so rain's got rain got several rain got um rain and rain's whole cluster got got several yeah i mm-hmm. guess i'm just I, I mean i guess first of all i don't think we're done with chris i don't necessarily think we're getting more chris interludes but definitely not not done with his character and and no that's uh, pretty safe to say i mean i, I don't know I, I i feel like there's a a decent chance that we get another sveta interlude I think that sounds entirely reasonable, cool. and they will not tell you you're wrong. Okay, so let's move on into the actual chapter now. Okay. So we join our interlude character, uh, unsleeping, uncomfortable, too warm, the light is either too dark or too bright, the feelings roiling, tormented by faces of the dead, and trapped in a body that's constantly on the verge of what I myself read as the feeling of like a hypnagogic jerk, but with lethal consequences. Yeah, that's one of those Matt words I had to look up. <laughs> it's it's all it's also what I would name my band, the, the Hypnagogic Jerks. That's perfect. You Thank should you. start a band. I, yeah, let's do it. Um, I don't know how to play. Um, what's music? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe I'll be your manager. Okay. Um, I think when you look at this chapter from a very high level, one of the big purposes of most of these twelve thousand words is to get us into a place where we fully understand and accept the reasoning behind Sveta's choice here, right? Um, why she's in a place where she's want, she's going to say yes to risking her progress, risking um, betrayal by a monster, risking working with these people to make this choice. And you might not necessarily agree with the choice that is made. And I, I think we'll see that when we get to our discussion question at the end of the episode. But what the chapter wants to do, one of the goals of the chapter is to make you understand it. And with that in mind, I think these opening paragraphs become some of the most important of the chapter they they their goal if the whole chapter's goal is to get you into that mindset these opening paragraphs have to do it quickly and fast and and efficiently and like this is the first time we've been in sveta's point of view right and we've we've known the struggles that she's gone through we've seen her from other people's angles we've seen her from people that care greatly about her but this is the first time we're seeing in her head and we know objectively what it must be like to be her because of it's, it's been described to us because we've seen it through Victoria. But experiencing it through her eyes is something totally different. And I, I messaged you yesterday because I was just reading the chapter again and I was like, these opening lines are incredible. These are the, the first six paragraphs just they're so good. And I read them over and over and over again because I found the writing there so powerful yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it's it's awesome. And, you know, we've talked before about this idea that Sveta puts a brave face on everything. She's mm-hmm. she's she has to be glasses half full because otherwise she'll just collapse. She'll crush the gra- glass. Yeah, exactly. And and here we're seeing. Yep. I mean, basically, that's that's right. She she her her kind of inner life is is much worse than I think she lets on to anyone, yeah. even to Victoria. 
um, this idea that she constantly is like on the like she feels like she's about to lash out and something horrible is going to happen. Basically, she just always feels like something horrible could happen in any second. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how the writing not not just the the content of the writing, but the the structure of the writing matches that it's very frantic like it has it has long sentences in these first few paragraphs but there's lots of commas in them there's lots of kind of it's just these ideas that are kind of rolling on top of each other at the same time like this this sentence here reflective natural movements each one prompting that surge of alarm of tension the desire to overcorrect overcorrect and overreact that feeling washed over her like a wave overlapping combining contradicting it's like these things like there's just so many thoughts so many emotions so many things hitting all at once the it's the writing is kind of tenderly and mm-hmm. i i love that about it i really do yeah it puts you in that mental state and, and i mean it's interesting because she has a uh, like a body made of thousands of tendrils but somehow mm-hmm. the the way that the writing focuses on what is relatable in in the experience right like it doesn't get lost in um the abstract description of like what it feels like to have a body that is thousands of tendrils. In fact, almost no writing is spent on the like actual sensation of that uh, other than a few really interesting places where she focuses on the fact that she feels her emotions differently than, than we do because you know, you're, yeah. you feel your emotions in your body and her body is very different. Right. Right. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's all, it's all kind of anchoring into relatable experiences. Like she relates it to the idea of, um, the feeling like you could, you're, you're on the verge of dropping a baby, um, yeah. which I think even if, even if you've never held a baby, you can kind of simulate what that would be like. Yeah. And that's exactly what she says. She's never held a baby. She's never had that memory. She's never experienced that, but she knows what it feels mm-hmm. like. Yeah. And that, I, that's actually my favorite moment in this whole thing, right? The early, early on in this, she describes herself as like constantly being on a ledge. And then later she says, I remember every single person that I've murdered and that, memory that feeling makes my ledge analogy that i just made to myself a lie it's not true it's like this idea that like i'm not even on the ledge anymore i'm off the ledge Mm -hmm. like i'm I'm already off the ledge i've killed people i'm already off the ledge i'm falling and all i can do right now is make sure that i don't hurt anyone else on the way down Mm -hmm. it's basically the way she feels constantly and that's it's a beautiful way to describe one of Sveta's central problem beyond just her lack of body, this idea of guilt, this idea of blame. And those are the emotions that are really going to carry us through this chapter. It's not just about the body. It's about the blame that she puts on herself, the guilt that she feels for the things that she didn't even have control over. And yeah. that's what I love about this chapter. Like we could have just wrote and written a chapter about suffering without a body, but it, it, Sveta is so much more of a, more complicated of a character than that. And and this is the, this is the, the wild bow thing is that everything is consistent because it's 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 I don't think it's a coincidence that it's alleged because yeah in, to my mind her formative moment of of heroism that also sort of was it was her her downfall if you will was basically alleged right it was trying yeah. trying to save her brother who was slipping down this ledge and we'll, we'll get there and I think we'll talk in more detail about what that you know the implications of that but but basically it's all it's all related to this idea of um wanting to be able to pull back from the threat of falling off of a precipice you know f- falling falling in, into you know lo- losing someone else specifically is what's interesting about it right yeah it wasn't yeah. her that was going to fall it was her brother that was going to fall and um i mean i guess i'm i guess i'm I am jumping ahead, but, but the, like, I don't think it's a coincidence that she has a power, which is like grabbing things and pulling things and, and pulling herself around when this form of event involved the threat of, of falling, basically. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's absolutely fine that you jump around. I think the, the, the reason why the writing of this chapter in particular is so effective is because it, all these things are inherently tied together. They're linked together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, th- I, I don't feel like I've fully kind of formulated the, the the thought here like what exactly what is it what does it say about her character that and what is it going to mean going forward that you know her 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 yes it was a, it's a problem for her to be in this body but it's also a problem for her to be the kind of person who constantly feels like she's on a ledge yeah um, yeah and i think we'll see that that is not like that is a part of her that is not connected to the body specifically. Yeah. That's a, that's a core part of her personality. Yeah. 
I think you're right. Yeah, I think we'll. I hope we come back to that when we get to the part where she's with the um, irregulars. I think we will. So at this point, um, Sveta has her art portfolio and she peruses its contents, which track her progress in gaining control over her body over the years. Yeah, I love this just, you know, visually as an idea to track her progress, like to, to like her improvement in writing tracks her improvement in control. And it, it serves to remind us like we're, we're going through this moment where we're showing how far she's come. And I think establishing how far she's come is important when you're 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 wrestling with the idea that she's risking this this progress for the hope of something better and Mm -hmm. i think that's important to to make sure you understand that if i had a complaint about it like a really minor one like i wish i wish the link between the art and her progress like i wish that wasn't as explicitly drawn as it was like the text basically comes out and says yeah this is what this means right Mm -hmm. um so um but that's that's a really minor you know that's yeah. just me. It, and I can absolutely see that that complaint. Um, I think I'm going to reply the same way that I've replied when it, w- <laughs> when it was about Victoria, which is that, like, um, these are very introspective characters. Yeah, that, and, you're right. And so and so to me, I'm just like, well, yeah, like they're entitled to their own kind of um, um, <laughs> narrativizing of their own lives. And, and that's actually what we're peering into. But, yeah, no, I, I see what you mean, though. So Sveta is then joined in this office where she sequesters herself by Miss Yamada, who brings her some things from Victoria, priming us to be aware of how preoccupied Victoria is with Sveta's situation. Mm -hmm. Um, Speaking of Victoria, it's clear that Victoria is definitely not over the hurt feelings from the diary incident. No, she is not. Um, But the thing that I like about this is it's very clear she's still upset with Jessica. She's still not talking to Jessica directly. She's kind of avoiding her. But... There is still a certain amount of respect there, right? Because she does send Jessica to Sveta with this idea that, like, I'm afraid that I'm influencing her to make this decision. I need someone that knows her that can make sure that she's making the decision because of her. So there's a level of respect for her craft still, you know? Yeah. Um, That so, like. I, I remember you talked last week about how you were kind of more hopeful that maybe this relationship between the two of them could be repaired. And this was a moment that made me think, oh, yeah, maybe maybe it could be. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it definitely doesn't help that, that the reason Victoria is enlisting her is like, well, I couldn't disagree with her more about this topic. So <laughs> right. she's the one I'm going to send in. That's true. That's true. But that, I mean, that's still I think is there's a level of respect to that. I think that's there. But Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I still think that this relationship can be repaired, but. There's a lot in these two chapters, actually, that kind of draws attention to ways that Victoria is not doing okay mm-hmm. that have nothing to do with the wretch. Like, yes, like, like, I feel like uh, a alternate dimension Victoria Dallin, who had never been wretched and and all of that stuff had never happened, would still need therapy for the exact things that she's having tr- trouble with in this chapter, you know? Uh, yeah, not this I mean, chapter, the next one, I mean, but yeah, I, I think there's something to that. And I, I like that idea generally because, you know, we've talked many times throughout these books as powers are a metaphor for trauma, like the 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 stuff that they go through superpower wise is just a way to discuss discuss the idea of the traumas people go through. But I love this idea that in the book, maybe as as you work towards recovery, you kind of realize, oh, this wasn't. This wasn't all the powers. There's, yeah. a, there's some other there's some underlying stuff going on here underneath the trauma based powers that is is completely separate from that. And yeah. I think actually Sveta is a perfect window to that. And what happens to Sveta in this chapter is a perfect window to that because her quote unquote main issue is solved by the end of it. So yeah. where we go with her from here is going to say a lot about that central idea, I think. Absolutely. I think that, um, I mean, Wildbo's done this several times where what's going on with the kind of focus character, the the focus breakthrough uh, character of the arc is reflecting through many other things in that chapter, including what's going on with Victoria at, yeah. at the time. And I think yeah. that this is absolutely the case is that, um, yeah, you know, Victoria got her wretch body fixed, but she still has a lot of residual trauma surrounding being the wretch. And she still has the original issues that led to her being a cape in the first place because everybody who's a cape is kind of screwed up anyway. Yep. That's all under there. And this, I think we're going to see something similar with Sveta. Yeah. Uh, the, the ability in this book to take the side characters and um, smartly and elegantly attach 
their issues to the things that the protagonist is going through, I think is cannot be understated. That's difficult to do, um, but it 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 is happening in this book very yeah, often. Absolutely. So the pair then discuss Ernesto Ocoa, uh, which I guess is is kind of a, a window that the story is using to talk about blame. Sveta argues that blame can keep you going and it provides flavor, like a flavor of anger that can get you through hard times. Jessica argues that it doesn't actually make those days better and it mainly just stalls your progress. And then Sveta kind of segues into the can of worms that is Rain's whole situation. <laughs> yeah, and I love this entire argument. I think I think both of the sides of this argument are pretty fascinating. Um, I think it's funny that Sveta mentions... Ernesto in her ability to show how blame keeps you going. But just earlier in the story, we saw uh, Ernesto's conclusion in Sveta's part of the story was that he hurt himself and had to leave the, the hospital. Like there was blood on the floor. Like when she's going through a painting, she sees a painting that she made that reminds her of the day Ernesto had to leave um, for whatever reason. And it's like, well, I mean, maybe <laughs> Sveta, maybe that's a counter to your own argument. There. Yeah. Sounds like it didn't work out too well for Ernesto. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, like he might have been surviving. He might have been making it through the days, but he certainly wasn't getting better. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that it's interesting. We've talked a bit about coping mechanisms on the show and yeah. and people have like like pe- people were kind of getting on our case for for talking about coping mechanisms in a negative light. And I think uh, I think the truth that I would that I would kind of stick by is there are good coping mechanisms and there are bad coping mechanisms and and yes. blame is definitely a very seductive one um blaming oneself blaming other people mainly blaming other people very seductive coping mechanism that kind of makes you feel a little bit better in the moment or at least it kind of shields you from immediate negative emotions in the moment but yeah. it's it's a it is not um there's no road through blame to something better and i yeah. think jessica is actually right about this yeah i and i i think I think the book says Jessica is right. I, I think I think this chapter kind of demonstrates the central idea that that blame is destructive. I think what Sveta goes through with the irregulars, a lot of the reason for that, for the choices that she made in that part is because of this distorted self-image that she has based on her guilt and blame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we'll get to that. Yep. But yeah, I mean, we, we got to talk about Rain a little bit because she brings up Rain and there's this this fascinating idea that that, hey, if you stop feeling guilty about what you've done, then you're not repenting anymore. But that's bullshit, right? Like, like what what signifies ongoing redemption? Is it how bad you feel about a thing or is it the actual things that you're doing? Like, is it your actual choices or, or how much you beat yourself up while you're making those choices? Like, I, like, do we want Rain to wallow in his guilt or do we want Rain to make awesome arms for Sveta that make her feel better. Like, which is better, which is more indicative of how a person is improving and fixing themselves. Yeah. I mean, th- this is something the story is definitely interested in talking about. And I yeah. think, I think I have my own personal answer. Um, and I think rain definitely doesn't want to let himself stop feeling that guilt. And, and Sveta is right. actually kind of on the same page with him. Interestingly. Yeah. Like, like and she, Victoria is as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, Victoria is like, yeah, it's, it's good that rain feels bad about this still. <laughs> And, <laughs> right, and, right. And Sveta kind of still wants to feel bad about um, what happened with the Irregulars. Yeah. Um, which, you I know, think is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there, go ahead. There's this there's this this trend here. and We're actually about to get to it. So this is perfect. This idea that blame helps you bring order to a world that makes no sense. Right. Mm. Um, Yamada goes on this this kind of speech here when she's trying to make sure Sveta makes a smart decision where she says there are no guarantees and there's no guarantee of justice in this. There were cultures where they would put hot coals on your tongue if you were on trial and if you were burned, you were guilty. There's no more rhyme or reason to how this ends up than there was that. And this idea that like blame and guilt are are kind of a way to make an orderly sense of a world that doesn't make it right. Like if you can say this bad thing happened because I did this bad thing, right? Um, if, if you can cr- like create a cause and effect chain out of life, then at least it makes sense, right? At least you don't have to worry about like random nonsense stuff happening. It's like, Oh, I did a bad thing. So then this bad thing happened to me. But I think what, one of the things that Yamada is saying in here is this just doesn't, doesn't work like that. It's that, that, we, those, that doesn't happen. That's not how life works. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think you're right, and and I think that it's it's seductive to believe that it does. Um, mm-hmm. and and maybe maybe Sveta is stuck in a place of believing that it does. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there there was we're spending I think a disproportionate amount of time talking about this conversation with Jessica because I think it's disproportionately important in terms of framing the chapter. Yeah, and the ideas that are being dealt with here. Yeah, I mean, I, at the end of this conversation. Sveta's made up her mind, right? And and arguably she had her mind made up before this conversation even even started, but she's verbalized her argument basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um so the the argument goes on to become much more specific uh, as they discuss the idea that Sveta can probably learn to live a full life with her quote-unquote disability, but Sveta pushes back pointing out that people who can resolve their disabilities tend to do so. Yeah, um so there's a lot here. Matt, and I, I kind of want to talk about this a little bit here because um, this is the text, you know, making a textual link between living with a disability and being a case 53. Mm-hmm. So this is this is a, a textual metaphor now. It is here. Um, and I, I, there's a there have been a lot of talk on uh, amongst the communities over the past week about um, the idea of Sveta and the idea of case 53s and Sveta more specifically being a, a transgender metaphor as well. And I like both of these things a lot. I like both of these these viewpoints on Sveta's situation. And it did not surprise me to hear that Wildbow had them both in his mind while he was constructing this character and what this character is going through. Um, I think he specifically said the uh, the disability metaphor was more front and center for him, which makes sense because it's it's literally in the text. Yeah. Um and I think this is really interesting, right? Because there's there's a lot of complicated stuff that I think the text is saying about this. That that this idea that a a person with disabilities fixing themselves, right? Um, there's some people that would agree that if you have the option to fix something, you should. Um, if it if it if it makes a better life for you, if you if you feel if it's what you want. But there's also people out there with the idea that hey, there's nothing wrong with you, right? Like that 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 th- this quote unquote dis- disability, these differently abled people, um, th- it's part of who they are and you shouldn't expect or want a person to fix that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's the, the kind of push and pull going on with, with this metaphor here. And I find that really fascinating because it's, it's a tough decision. It's complicated. It's complex. People are going to have different opinions on it. I mean, we asked a discussion question about this and many people have different opinions on why yes or no, they think a character should or should not do this. And I mean, I don't know, like, so I guess my question for you is, do you think this is specific allegory or do you think it's just a metaphor? Um, hmm. And uh, the, the, the important distinction between those two words, of course, is that allegory is sending a specific message. It's, it's, it's concluding on something. And I don't know if this is. See, I, I feel like in general, Walbo tends not to um, conclude or, or, I mean, the, the negative way of framing it would be moralize. Like he's, yeah. he's almost, I, I can't think of a single time when he's like clearly telling you what the right answer is. Um, yeah. He, yeah. even in extremely fucked up situations, he's, he's, he's setting up a fucked up situation and letting you figure it out. And yeah, he, his character will come to a, will come to a certain decision, but that, that doesn't mean that that was the right decision. That's just the decision that was right for the character yes. um, and consistent for the character. Um, I mean, I, I definitely like. Um, I, I've had, I've had surgeries to fix things that were wrong with me. And, and I, I don't even put quotes around that. Cause like, I, I believe they were wrong with me and wanted them fixed. Yeah. And then after they were fixed, um, in, in some cases I was, I was like let down because it wasn't, um, like, like you kind of imagine that you're going to be like perfect after that. And it's like, nope, you still, you, you still have your body, your body, still your body. Um, and then after <laughs> right. some of them, it, it like this, like the surgery worked out as well as it could have. And then I, and it, I was just like, oh, okay, well, I'm still me though. Like, <laughs> like right. it, it doesn't really, it doesn't yeah. really change who you are in any, in any way. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, the, the effects, if, 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 if any are like very difficult to actually see and appreciate in, in kind of a visceral way. And so I like th- that's, you know, I, I, don't, I haven't really talked about the fact that I've had like weird invasive surgeries on the on the show, um, I guess, because it's personal. And but but like that, that's maybe one reason why uh, the story is actually uh, gets to me kind of often because it is about yeah. these like body image concepts that that are that are pretty close to home for me. And um, like this idea of, of Sveta considering doing this to her body is something that I've basically had basically been in this situation, although I didn't have a tentacle body. Um, (laughs) 
So <laughs> good so old like, Matt tendrils. Yeah, the, the tendrils. They did fix the tendrils. Good. Um, I'm glad. But but like basically, um, what I'm saying is that the the disability slash like uh, wanting to fix something wrong with your body is something that that I absolutely just came right off the page and and felt very like personal to me. Yeah. Um, so whether that makes it metaphor or allegory, I I don't know. See, I don't like allegory. Uh, that's I I agree with Tolkien's assessment that I find it inherently limiting because like if you say if if we sit here and declare that Sveta's case 53 situation is an allegory for uh disability, then what you're kind of saying isn't is you're kind of inherently devaluing the transgender metaphor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that's just as good of a read of the situation. I think that read has a lot of merit to it. I like it. I like that read. Um, and, and allegory to me is so restrictive and whereas metaphor is open, right? Like, and, and I don't, I don't think this is because I, I don't, I don't think this is concluding is moralizing is teaching is instructing. I think this is just, the same thing that we do with trauma, the same thing that we do with everything else. So um, this this whole conversation could be because there was an episode of Writing Excuses on Allegory. <laughs> <laughs> it's a podcast I listened to on Allegory this weekend, and it, and it popped into my head and it had me thinking about Allegory like all day the last two days. Um, but I did see some people call it Allegory, and, and I just don't like that as much. Mm-hmm. You know? my, yeah, I mean, my personal preference is always... Like if someone says it's a transgender metaphor, I'm like, oh, cool. And then if someone else says it's a disability metaphor, I'm like, oh, cool. Right. Yes, right. everything. It's a I mean, I, I want to be like as broad as possible. Be like, yeah, it's a it's a trend. It's a self transformation metaphor. It doesn't even yeah. have to be physical. It can be yeah. it can be beyond physical. It, it, it's a metaphor. It's, it's a way of speaking about what it's like to live with something about yourself that you despise. And, and then the capacity to change it comes within your grasp. And what do you do? Yeah, I mean, you could you could take this outside of just physical transformation, right? Yeah, yeah, you could you could be more broad with it. And I think I think that's great and I and I love that and I love how that's one of the things I love about writing and I just feel like pinning it down um is just the opposite of that. Um not that authorial intent doesn't matter. I think it does, but it's not the only thing that matters. Well, yeah, and and I mean, I think just talking about how a piece of writing is is affecting you is um, you know, it's completely valid and, and productive. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and you learn from it. Cool. And, and so to, to move on into the text, but I, I really think it's basically the same thing that we were just talking about just now is, is the, the text says, she touched the shadowy silhouette of the child on the page. And then Svetha says, I want to be her again. Ugh. And I think this is worth talking about because like I was just saying, this is definitely impossible. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can fix a lot of things. Medical technology is amazing in, in the real world. Um, but you can't, what you can't ever do is go back to who you were before. Like, it almost doesn't matter what. The the, the trauma of the event, the, the changes in your situation will, will persist. We've talked plenty about the idea that Victoria is physically exactly who she was the day she got melted, more or less. Yeah. Um, but that didn't magically erase the trauma. And she spent two years basically uh um completely incapacitated by it and so yeah, again like we we talked about this earlier this idea that she if, if her expectation if her hope is that she's she wants to be she wants to be the person she was before cauldron got her that hope is going to be crushed right yeah yeah I, I agree. I agree. And and that's that's part of why the tension of this chapter works so well is because you hear stuff like this and you're like, oh, no, you're going to be so disappointed. <laughs> you're yeah. Like, it's not going to work out that way for you. Um, it's not going to solve everything for you. And if she puts too much pressure on that idea, it could be a disaster for her. And And I love how the book kind of takes that metaphor and almost makes it literal like like the parahumans universe does because we learn here that that mr bow has told her that her mental image of who she's supposed to be is going to be important to how things end up right Mm -hmm. like as part of his power and we'll talk about this when we get to the surgery itself but part of his power is that that how she imagines herself being influences how she actually is and that's i mean that's the wonderful and the literal, but like on a metaphorical level, yeah, that's 
that's how we work. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly how we work. And and part of this the the through line of this chapter is how much Sveta's mental image of herself doesn't quite match up to the way that we see her. Mm-hmm. And it's again driven by that blame that she has. Yeah, that's 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 a really good point. In, in fact, um, I think that there is a note of foreboding when he says that because you're immediately like, uh, uh oh, like yeah, we we know that there's a lot of darkness inside her, so that could be that could be something that tips the the procedure over the edge into a bad place. Right, right. So we get a flashback to uh, Sveta's, or shall we say, uh, Nayette's childhood uh, as she and other children paint the rocky shore of their habitation with bright orange pigment to assist in uh, mermaid fisherman navigation. <laughs> um, just kidding. Apparently they're more like manatees, but I prefer to imagine they're mermaids. I thought they were for a hot minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, the kids engage in what seems from context to be childish banter with a bit of bullying perhaps. Uh, and then they draw dicks on everything. It's great to see that no matter what universe you live in, um, you just want to draw dicks on things. Yeah. You know, it's great. Um, I, Go ahead. I, I, I love this scene. I, I lo- like this whole this whole flashback. I think it's really great. I love the writing, the detail, the difference of it. Like the, the, the manatees are called the forever drowning. I love that Wild Bill commits to this idea that the dialogue is going to be in another language. And therefore, um, he has to have confidence that we're going to be able to follow what's going on, even though the dialogue is nonsense words to us. Yeah. Um, and it works. It does. Um, and it's this, this this description of this like this idealistic dangerous slash beautiful life that these people lived. Um, I, I think it's great. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting how um, they're, they're all kind of strange dangers that you're not familiar with, right? Like, like yeah. the, the, the rocks and everything. Um, so eventually the needling banter drives the, the little brother into a precarious place on the rocks and then he falls becoming injured and stuck. Sveta then risks her life and takes on injuries herself in rescuing him. Um, I think like what we were talking about earlier, we should talk here about the role that this little story of the backstory plays in Sveta's overall characterization and development because yeah. here she steps up to save her brother, but was she kind of partly responsible for him needing to be saved in the first place? Was she kind of partaking in that bullying that drove him over there? And if so, does this echo or interact with her choice to uh, not tell well what's going on later with the irregulars? Yes. I, I the, the the quick answer to that question is yeah I think it is supposed to echo, and I I, th- I think this this also echoes what we were talking about earlier with the the idea of blame with the idea of um this this really weird thing weird and frustrating thing that that we do and that Sveta specifically does here do is focus on the the blame issue of it right mm-hmm. like and and this is before this is before she's was taken by cauldron this is before any of that this is a core characteristic of her character um she goes out there she saves him she saves his life pulls him up and then her first thought is well is it is it my fault that he was there in the first place mm-hmm. and like this is not how the world works like i said before like doing some ribbing and some teasing and maybe even a little bit of bullying of your your brother did not cause him to trip on rocks and hurt himself, mm-hmm. right? Like that's just not like you can you can try to make that that cause and effect chain there and and blame yourself for it. Or you could just realize that sometimes just random shit happens in the world and all you can do in that moment is make a choice for what you're gonna do about it. And she does. She saves him. She is a hero. There there's another boy there with them. He's the big strong guy. He's too afraid. She's not. She does it. And and importantly, I think important to the 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 order of events here, it's not until after she's already made the decision to risk her life to save her that she starts focusing on the blame part. So which I think is the book kind of telling us that it's not that she was motivated by blame to do good. It's that she does good inherently and also blames herself at the same time. Yeah, I, I think that's really crucial because I don't want to take away from her the the heroic streak that she really has. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but definitely there's this element that recurs in her storyline of um being being responsible for the situation that she then has to be a hero in which sort of muddies it in her own mind, right? right it's it's right. more about what's happening in her own mind. Yeah. And she can't focus on the heroic part. She can't focus on the fact that I just saved my brother's life. I did that. Yeah. I risked myself. I hurt myself. I did it. No, I I have to focus on, well, the only reason he was there was because of me. No, 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you think Sveta has, has like some sense that like the universe is punishing and, and rewarding uh, in proportion to people's deeds? Do you yeah, think that's I in do. the text? Yeah. Because um, that's a good way to drive yourself completely crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> unless you're like a practitioner and you, but anyway. And I um, wonder like, the thing about that is it's one of those things that I don't think Sveta views the world at large that way. Like, I don't think she thinks like all the bad things that happened to Victoria are happening to Victoria because Victoria did bad things. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's very insular focused. Like she's turning that universal karma system only on herself. Yeah. I, it's not, it's not the other people. Like the bad things that happened to Weld aren't because Weld did bad things. No, Weld's perfect. But the bad things that happened to me are because I'm yeah. responsible for yeah, that. Like it doesn't it doesn't ri- rise at the level of being like a religious conviction, but um, it's yeah. definitely present in in internally. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with you. Um, but regardless of whether this particular moment is meant to rhyme with her later actions, I do think that a traumatic event centered around grasping and pulling led to her form, um, and maybe her brother's apparent transformation into like rocks was related to the fact that he was scraped up by rocks. Yeah, I mean, we see later it's like black rocks, right? Yeah. So like, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think that's great. And I, I, I made the link to the brother. I didn't, I didn't in my head, like transfer this idea of when she's like desperately trying to climb up and stretch and grab mm-hmm. and pull as hard as she can to climb up these rocks while, while her, all of her limbs are getting sliced up. Um, I didn't, I didn't put that together, but I think, I think you're onto something there for sure. Yeah. Cause it's not just trying to get herself up. It's trying to pull her brother up. Actually. I think that, that makes right. it manifest this way. And, and I think her, you know, her durability feeds into it too. She basically yeah. got a super, super powered grasping and pulling, um, and, and, uh, and durability. Right. So, yeah. 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 Cool. And, and by the water too. Right. And, and she, she always loves the water. She can swim really well. Like that's yep. something that's noted. So very true. It's cool how that all works out. So there are a lot of fun touches in this chapter that make you really feel like it was written from a very foreign perspective. Um, stuff like she'd strained every muscle in her body from toe to tongue to get Demi to safer ground. And now that the battle shock she leaned on to save Demi was leaking away. Um, so I didn't read that quite perfectly, but the, the, the idioms toe to tongue and battle shock, they definitely feel like very foreign idioms that are like unique to her culture. And I, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think that along with the idea of the forever drowning to describe the manatees, um, that it, it's, it's little tiny detail work that really cement the other ish nature of this, uh, the society yeah. that makes you feel like it's something different from, you know, the, the rest of the, the life lives that these characters live. Yeah. It doesn't really pattern match to any culture, right? It doesn't really pattern. You're, no. you're, you're not thinking like, Oh, this is like uh other dimension, Asia or other dimension, you know, South America. It's like, right. Oh, I have no, this is weird. This is completely it different. Feel, yeah. It feels unique. Yeah. 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 Uh, so speaking of cultural perspectives, there's a terrible storm and then three cauldron monsters arrive and take her and her brother. And you know, the reason why I mentioned cultural, cultural perspectives is that I think one of them is, clockwork but sveta lacks the reference to to make this assessment so the description is a woman with features like nothing any of them had seen before gleaming and clicking in time like a music stripped of joy interlocking pieces wove in and out of each other like fibers for a tunic toothed like a saw with teeth meshing ever-changing parts shuffling and turning in time with the ticks of the joyless music an endless inevitable kind of rapping like a man striking the same part of a drum every beat for all eternity um so first of all that's awesome yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it's like a clockwork person. But Man, so, I tell yeah. I tell you what, I'm so terrible at like visualizing things sometimes that until you like said, is this a clockwork person? And I really went back and read it with that image in my head. I couldn't put that together because I'm just like my my brain with visualizing like the looks of people and costumes and that kind of thing. Just it sucks. It's really bad. Well, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was interesting because I couldn't I couldn't visualize it. And then I was like, OK, wait a second. I think this is something that Sveta just doesn't know how to describe because she doesn't have. Yeah. 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 But I mean, once, once I have that in my head, once I have that visualization in my head and I go back and read it, I realize how beautifully crafted those sentences are, right? Mm -hmm. Ever changing parts, shuffling and turning in time with the ticks of the joyless music and endless inevitable kind of rapping. Um, it's, it's beautiful. It really is. It's, it's such great writing. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it sounds good to read out loud too. Like, I don't even know if I noticed that until, until yeah. I was reading it just now and I was like, oh, yeah. that's got some really great assonance and 
and yeah. uh, and stuff going on. I mean, there. it's it's so like sometimes like it's so hard to be conscious of that while you're writing because you're not mm-hmm. writing for reading aloud, but there is a certain meter to it kind of that fits what, what the description of the clockwork is. I think that's great. Totally. And, and I love, like, I love the description of these three guys that Sveta calls them the three deaths, right? There's the bludgeoning death, the prowling death. And then this clockwork lady is the transformative death. And those are such evocative labels as well. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think we know who any of these cauldron capes are. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't think, we know who they are. I don't recognize them. I don't think. But we know the company that sent them. We know the the tilted cup etched in black is mm-hmm. how she describes the cauldron logo, which is just perfect. And we know why they're here. They know they're here to take the sick, dying children away and, and turn them into monsters. And so this label of death, you know, really cements that mood of, of them being here. And I love it. Yeah, me too. Can we fuck cauldron? Like yeah. so, so much. Like these... They come and they're like, oh, well, your children are dying and they're sick because there's the worst storm you've ever seen and people were injured already. We could, um, well, they'll live if they come with us. Uh, yeah. Or you can bring them antibiotics, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck culture. No, nah, no, nah, man. That, the prime directive. Yeah, totally. For the greater good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would, it would. See, the prime directive is is totally evil, and this absolutely proves it, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think I think if someone's dying and you say, "No, I can't give you yeah. life saving technology," yeah, because I'll, I'll take your children, and they may live. Yeah. So then we cut back right where we left off from Sveta and Jessica's discussion. Sveta, sorry, Jessica manages to be super foreboding, uh, and I don't know. Like Jessica definitely has a very specific point of view on all this stuff, but. I don't know if she's really helping here. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. I don't know. Like, like I said, I think Sveta had already made up her mind before Sveta walked through the door. Um, and I don't think Jessica's role in the story here is to change her mind. But I do think sometimes it's just good to, uh, you know, make your points and have your the, those points challenge a little bit. Sometimes it's good to just say, here's why I'm doing this. And then having a person say, well, is that really good? That's why I wish... Um, you could just like correct, like tell me I'm wrong sometimes. So like my points are challenged, but, uh. <laughs> um, I, I do, I do think, I do think Jessica didn't mean to be foreboding here. Like I certainly didn't think she said, like she said, um, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you and I'll help you no matter what to mean. Oh, this is definitely going to fucking fail. Right. Um, I think she just I think she honestly thinks that the surgery is not a risk worth taking. I, I think that's what she believes. And I think that that might be subtly informing how she's talking about this, how she's saying I'm here for you, how she's leaving the conversation. Um, but, I, you know, I think I'm here for you no matter how it goes is something that a supportive person would say to to most people before surgery. Right. I, 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 you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe yeah. not. Yeah, um, I do think it's interesting that the next thing that happens is Jessica is she asks Jessica for some blood to be part of the procedure, and Jessica's like, "Nah," uh, but I'm totally here for you. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, are you really like, are you really here for me? Because that's, I mean, I I can understand like I can understand not wanting to give the blood, but but it, is it a little bit disingenuous to say that you're here for someone if you're then like, oh, not not that way though, you know? I don't know. I, I'm, yeah, I, I I feel I feel like I'm being unfair even as I say that, <laughs> but um I I don't know. It's, I mean, it's complicated. It is to me the blood is a perfect symbolic representation of I do not support this decision. Mm-hmm. Right? It's because like I'm here for you. I I love you. I'm gonna be here for you for no matter what. I don't agree with what you're doing, and therefore I can't I can't I can't like literally support you in that. I can't aid you in that. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess there's the aspect that like Jessica was basically sent here to be the person to push back against this. So yeah. I can't blame her for basically doing what she's supposed to be doing. Yeah. And yeah. and she could have been right too, right? Like it's not it's not like I'm blaming her for pushing back against I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just I, I think I I honestly have like um I'm I'm mad at Jessica. And I want her to, um, I want her to, to earn back my trust as, as a human being. There you go. That's, that, that's, that's probably that's... the actual pr- reason for my ambivalence here. I'm glad, I'm glad you're being honest <laughs> with yourself. I think you should, um, 
talk to Victoria for a little bit mm-hmm. and, and let her know. Yeah. Maybe the two of you can work on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I have faith that Jessica and my relationship can be repaired eventually, but not Good. today. <laughs> so we go back to flashbacks and we get our first and basically our only fully explicit window into the hell that was Victoria's, uh, sorry, <laughs> that was uh, Sveta's existence prior to being captured and put in the asylum. We see how her body force feeds her if it's hungry and will force feed her people if she doesn't eat the bugs and the rodents it finds. At most, she can urge her body in, in a direction with sustained focus, but not really control it. Yeah, the, I, I love. I mean, I love the, this is a, this is horror awesome, right? Like, yeah. I love, I love that it's. I mean, it's horrifying. Like this idea that like you can't you can't kill yourself. Like you can't starve yourself. Like your body won't allow it. It'll force food down your throat. Um, I, I love in this section how externalizing Sveta is being of her body. She says it ignored her. Um, her body did this, her body did this. It's a, it's a completely different entity at this point. At this point of her life, she has no control. Uh, her body is basically the wretch, right? It mm-hmm. does what it wants. It, it kind of goes in the direction she wants it to every once in a while, as long as you appease it. And so she's fully otherized it and it operates independently. And uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, mashing food into your mouth. Ugh. Yeah, it's a great catch that she calls it, you know, it. I, mm-hmm. I don't think I caught that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love this one line in particular where she's thinking about the memories of, of the time before. And she says that was stability to dream of things lost and to live to avoid more loss. So even even in this early part of, of her journey in this new form, um, we're, we're kind of seeing how how blame becomes a stabilizing factor for her. Right. She's thinking about the past. She's thinking about what she's lost um, and, and she's thinking about how those losses and the things she's done can help avoid more loss in the future. And it's already being a stabilizing force for her here, in her mind at least. Right. I mean, it's basically her life philosophy is like um, completely based around loss aversion rather than yeah. any kind of like hope for, for achieving, you know, yeah, yeah. For, for anything better. Yeah. It's so rough. Yeah. And and I think it's kind of soaked in, right? Like it's, I don't know. I, I, I mean, yeah. she's definitely doing better in the current time. Sure. But yeah. I think this is, this is some deep, deep, uh, programming. Yeah. So in the end, she's captured quite nonviolently by a heroine who grabs her and hugs her. Yeah. And we learn later that this is wield maiden of Mm. the guild, a cape. I don't think we've ever met. I don't think so. But I automatically love. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And, and one thing, one thing that this made me realize about Sveta's story, despite the tragedy of it all, she always has someone, right? Like, like there's always someone that comes and helps her. Someone that actually does care about her deeply. This hero gives her an unbearably kind hug as soon as she realizes that Sveta isn't in control of her body. And this one person that just met Sveta and Sveta just messed, met can already do what she can't do herself, which is absolve her of blame. And I think that's so important to the people that Sveta is surrounded with. To yeah. her growth and to her improvement. Yeah, that's that's really cool because, like, the, like you said, the, the first thing she does is she's like, "Oh, this isn't you doing this," you know. Yeah, that's really cool. And gives her a big old hug. Yeah, which and then the hugs become a thing for for Sveta, right? Like they mean a lot to her. And mm-hmm. and you know, another thing that's been happening in this chapter, which I haven't really been pointing out because this is the first one I think that kind of rose to my conscious awareness, uh, was that we were basically match cutting between the sections in this chapter. So we, we match cut, uh, from, uh, from wheel maiden, giving her a hug to Victoria immediately entering the room and giving her hug as soon as uh, Jessica leaves. Yeah. And And so one more thing, I'm sorry. Yeah. She describes the hug as unbearably kind. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a perfect phrasing because like that's a phrasing that shows that she doesn't think she deserves it. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I, I, God, I love it. I love the detail there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think you're exactly right. So uh, after Victoria joins her, they talk about this slate of, sorry, this state of features ongoing reputational attack. Uh, Victoria suggests that Sveta lock herself in a cell because she's worried about control. And Sveta does accept this suggestion after first being upset by it. She goes down to the cell and she decorates it with her art, willing Bao to see it and to recognize her humanity. Yeah, I I love I love that moment. It's like see me for who I am. See, like you have please please see me for the human I am because you're the one that's going to be making me into a human. I love that that yeah. little detail. 
we got to spend a little bit of time here looking at Victoria, right, Matt? Because yeah. we're seeing Victoria from another point of view and we don't get these options very often. So um, we see Victoria from the point of view of Sveta and and it's this person. I, I love I love her. Like you don't we don't see the doubt. We don't see the uncertainty. We just see the kindness. She cares immensely. Like we didn't talk about this before, but she brought a pillow earlier because she knew Sveta was very self-conscious about other people's pillows. She brought clothes that she thought she would like. She brought art supplies for her, not knowing that she already had some. Um, it's five a. It's five o'clock in the morning, and she's awake and there to be with her friend. Like we see in this moment when they're walking towards um, the base to put her the, in, into the cell. Um, she's fatigued enough that she gets one of the passwords slightly wrong on Kenzie's password thing. She messes up the first time she's exhausted, but she's still there and she's not complaining and she's, and it's just, I love Victoria. And I mean, yes, we're being kind of biased by being, seeing her from the perspective of someone that absolutely adores her, but it's just so great to see her like the way other people see her. Yeah, that's one thing about this chapter I loved was how much the Victoria stuff in the chapter absolutely works on me. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we talk about this a lot. Whenever we see her from the outside, we know her well enough to kind of know what's going on with her on the inside. And um, and, and I'm just like a, a lot of the a lot of the moments that were kind of like a micro, you know, emotional gotcha were actually showing like how much Victoria is uh, is like upset by what's going on and anxious about what's going on like anxious to the point where she's kind of like desperate to, to make it work work out right and yeah and like like we see that she's there for all of the procedures obviously and um yeah like like the fact that victoria is is like like it just cares for her so much is part of what makes it so impactful i think yeah i agree so victoria then delivers the blood vials from herself swan song precipice and armstrong yeah, and, and to connect us to the, the metaphor of Jessica not giving one means she was not really supportive of this choice. We see these are her team saying her team and her, you know, adopted father kind of saying we're with you on this. We yeah. support you. Um, and and it, this isn't to say that Kenzie and Tristan and, and Byron aren't supportive. I think they specifically say we didn't ask Kenzie. Tristan has a thing with needles. If you ask, he'll uh, he'll give you stuff. Yeah, They didn't and, ask Byron. Um, well, my Byron. take on that was that if you're taking blood from Byron, then you're stabbing Tristan with a needle. I guess yeah, he still would feel uncomfortable. Which, which is basically basically if one of them objects, and the answer yeah. is no, which yeah, just sounds but, fair to me. Yeah, but I mean, it's just this this idea that these are your family, yeah, and your family supports you. They're 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 here, yeah. Um, and I think that's a great moment for her, right? I, I mean, really do. She doesn't even end up using all this this blood, right? Um, I I think it was a wise choice not to ask Kinsey. <laughs> Yeah, or, probably. I mean, or, or maybe they did ask Kenzie or I don't know. They, did, like, they like, didn't ask her, if, but they said we didn't ask Kenzie, but you know what she would have said. Yeah. <laughs> like if Kenzie's that just sounds like exactly the kind of thing where it, Kenzie would uh, spiral on that. How, thing. how much do you need? Do you need all of it? Yeah. Are we connected now forever? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you're, you're now you're now part of me. Yeah. Right, <laughs> oh, gosh. Right. Yeah. Um, Poor then, Kenzie. then while Bill unexpectedly, uh, completely destroys us as we cut to Sveta's time in the asylum and her first meeting with Victoria, um, little, little note, she's being escorted by a nurse who calls her, who calls her Garot, Garot, sorry, I always say that wrong. Uh, um, and we find that was, that was nails on a chalkboard to me that, uh, yeah. the, the usage of that where I was like, don't call her that. Yeah. Um, right. All right. Yeah. And then we get this. Sveta thought what she was looking at was 10 or 15 people sprawled across the couch, an arm thrown here or there, a leg thrown over over there. Sorry, a long thrown over there. Ah, Jesus Christ. <laughs> an arm thrown over here, a leg thrown over there, a head resting against backrest, another dangling near the floor, all in the same dull gray sweat clothes, all with the same blonde hair, cropped short, except in one case where it grew long, except they were one person. Whew. Yeah, I didn't didn't know we were getting this. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the most visually impactful scenes in the book for me so far. And and the thing is, we've seen Victoria as the wretch before, right? Yeah. We saw it in Worm. Um we've listened to Victoria describe this form. We've we've listened to her describe the the wretch. We've listened to we've seen the the force field as it is now. But because we're in someone else's point of view now we see a description of it that's so much more because Victoria has such, a, has such trouble describing it and yeah. like of visualizing it and verbalizing it. 
we're just seeing it in a, in a way that we've never seen it described before. Yeah. And it's awful. Like it's, it's heartbreaking. Like I love the, the little beat, the little beat of all with the same blonde hair cropped short, except in one case where it grew long. And you can kind of see that one that, that maybe that, that is like, that's Victoria's head, right? Yeah. Like this is, this is, this is my like this is my head and all the other heads are other heads. Right. So I we take care of the one head but not the right. other heads. And like just this idea, like it has just never been described in this way before. And I was like completely destroyed. Completely. Yeah. Well, it, it, not just the description, but the subsequent interaction between yeah. them and, and yeah. seeing Victoria's kind of just like hopelessness and and then like gradually growing you know Ugh. genuine interest in the actual conversation they're having because yeah you know that they they bond basically over um the fact that victoria knows weld and um that, there's a lot of great lines in here pretty much everything victoria says is is great and and impactful but i thought it was yeah. particularly poignant when victoria like she isn't like uh, oh don't worry you can't hurt me because i have a force field she's like don't worry if you maim me i don't care yeah because that's yeah. that's where she is right now. Yep. I have another head. If you rip off one of my heads, I have another. If you rip off one of my arms, I have another. Yeah. yeah. And as much as that is depressing and horrifying and the description is depressing and horrifying, this conversation between them is the most heartwarming stuff in the world. This is when I, I, I shed a tear yeah. in this chapter. I think this is beautiful. This This bonding between these two suffering people. And like we've known about this. The whole time we've known that these two people met, we've known that these two people came together and found strength in each other and, and bonded and grew. And we know that they've been through all this stuff, but seeing it, seeing it after the amount of time we've been with this character just destroyed me. Like, I, I think it's so amazing how these, how fast these two kind of settle into a rhythm of casual conversation, a conversation that sounds so much like the conversations we've seen them have in the present day in their friendship. Like I, Victoria says, warning, get me going on this topic and I may not stop. And you just see her. That's like, Oh, that's, that's the Victoria. I know that's her right there. And yeah. it's, Oh, it's, I love it. It's, uh, I love everything about it. I really do. Yeah. I, I like involuntarily remembered when they meet at the beginning of this story mm-hmm. and you see Sveta's reaction to her having her body. And I was I know. like, and oh like that, God. that was my like looking up, blinking moment you know yeah um that was that's that's amazing it's beautiful it's beautifully (sighs) written it's everything i wanted it to be i just didn't i didn't expect it to hit me as hard as it did because it's like yeah i know they meet like you know just from a purely logical standpoint yeah i know they meet and they uh they they were friends and then they become best friends and but like seeing it yeah seeing it absolutely i agree that i mean that's the power of i think the difference between dramatizing something and just kind of implying it yeah, like 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 it. It's it, we we believed that they had a friendship. It, it, it yeah. was a it, as, as far as fiction goes. This this is a a, a great friendship, um, but seeing seeing this part of their friendship dramatized makes it impactful on a whole different level. Yeah, yeah. So we then begin the relatively rapid fire sequence of visits with uh, Mister Bao, as he outlines the procedure. Effervescent is on hand to interject doubt and anxiety into this. Um, uh, in, into basically all the interactions. He offhandedly explains that those self-mutilating guys in Boston were trying to like control their power manifestation, which is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I love, I love the use of Effie here, Matt. I, Cause like, yeah, she's, she's been this character that we're just kind of generally annoyed by uh-huh. constantly throughout the story. And like, she doesn't like Victoria very much cause she can't really get a good read on her. And but but now she's here helping. And I think that's such a huge idea. Like this kind of endears me to her character a bit. She's here. She's helping them out. She didn't have to be here. She's doing it. And it's like the, w- there's this group of people gathering around Sveta to help her and support her to make sure this goes as smoothly as possible. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So while it's something to kind of dismiss it as just like powers details, I think it's interesting that Bao, like w- what he actually does, because part of the process like we said, is tapping into Sveta's self-image. And and he also warns her that this process will be ugly. Yeah, and that's 
this is I mean, this is really where you start to get really nervous, right? You're going to get we're we're going back to this idea of your self-image is so important to how this is going to work. And I was so utterly convinced something was going to go wrong at this point. Like we keep having these beats again and again where where we see how negative and how uh, how blame driven Sveta's image of herself is. And you're like, oh, God, like is this person who who only seems to be able to focus on, you know, how everything's her fault? Is that going to result in a good good mix here? Right, right. I don't know. I was so worried about it. Yeah, I was worried about it too. I mean, I, I honestly thought that this chapter was setting us up for something horrible, right? Yeah. Like yeah. That, that was the feeling the whole time. In fact, that, that's why it's like a wonderful subversive way of, of, of structuring <laughs> it because – the the payoff is so much more powerful because you're just like oh really what a what a gift <laughs> right right um, um yeah there is one part i want to focus on before we move on because i find this really interesting because bow is like as he's talking about this idea of self-image he said if you were willing to let my companion do his thing he could unlock your missing memories and make that connection much stronger bring your body closer to your actual self that's buried deep in your memories and victoria is like absolutely no she's like she she interrupts him and says no she says no again um we're not doing that even the victoria who has has been driven to kind of allowing things that she never thought she would allow that's too much for her and sveta agrees for now yeah <laughs> that's that's the most important part of this is agreed at least for now and earlier in the chapter sveta said she wanted to be that girl again right she looked at that picture and wanted to be that girl and now we see here drowsing has the ability to bring back some of those memories and make that connection stronger, make that ability to get back to that girl. It's a little bit better. And that's why I'm like, Oh God is uh -huh. like, is this going to be a, a ch like a chasing that ideal situation, right? Where she, you know, the first week is great. She's like, has this new body and it's great and it's everything she wanted to be. And then suddenly it's like, well, I could, I could be a little bit closer. Well, maybe yeah. can we maybe, just bring that guy. Like, I just, I don't know. Like all that stuff was in the back of my mind here. Like, yeah. at least for now, that's such a, such a loaded way mm. to end that argument. Yeah, I didn't catch that, but I, I, I am terrified now because <laughs> remember the, the, the cape they caught and they put in the prison, di prison dimension who like was basically like stole other people's beauty constantly. Yeah. It's like, which is sort of like a, the cape analog of like somebody with plastic surgery addiction. Yeah. Where they're, they're, they're sort of, permanently chasing some perfection which is unattainable and yeah. um yeah there was there was another similar there have been a lot of similar horrifying things actually like this idea that that chris is sort of doing the same thing in, in a way right like he's sort of yeah. ex experimenting and iterating on his vials so that he can get to a point where he is the way he wants to be yeah. For, for good like he wants to not be what he is and that's like yeah okay well i don't know if that ever ends right yeah yeah that's i mean that's the fear right does yeah. it does it yeah no no th thanks for pointing that out that's terrible <laughs> so sorry yeah. sorry so uh as as this bit ends we again match cut from bow saying this will be ugly to weld saying this will be ugly talking about the planning invasion uh, planning the invasion of the cauldron headquarters uh, Sveta is uh, in his bedroom, which is, I guess, like the bed of a truck, uh, giving him a, a, a pep talk. Uh, and, and she screws up her courage to the point of telling him some of her feelings and then kissing him and then running away. I like how his bed is like a, just a pile of tires. Right. And then he's like thrown down some pillows for the other people. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, I mean, this is the birth of the Sveta Weld relationship we're seeing here, Matt. Um, and we see that our girl made the first move. Yeah. Which props, like yeah. major props. Good job, Sveta. But I think if we look at this, there's a lot of red flags going on here, right? Yeah. Um, if you had showed me this beginning without knowing the ending, I probably would have given this relationship six months tops. <laughs> because, like, I think the relationship is born on the central idea that they see greatness in the other person, but nothing in themselves. Like, like Weld says, I like us too but I don't like me. And then Sveta says, if you could only see yourself, how I see you. And he says, likewise back to her. And it's this idea that like, neither of them is happy with themselves, but they, they, especially in Sveta's case, like, like deify the other person. Like she is like utterly convinced in his perfect, wonderful greatness. And that just like, it's a bad way to start a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, I think I agree with your take. Like there's just not 
it's not a fantastic foundation. I think you kind of covered all the bases. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And and it's not surprising that it kind of has ended up the way it has. Although, yeah. you know, I, I don't think we should say ended up because I don't I don't think it. I, I think I think there's room for more horrible things to happen with Weld. Honestly, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, the 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 idea of okay, Weld, I got a body now. Uh-huh. What what about it? Yeah. I think that's an inherently wonderful, Powder dramatic cake. thing to yeah. explore. Right. Um, so yeah. yeah, no, the 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 Weld sweat and I mean Weld is notoriously absent from this entire interlude like in the present time right he's right. not there so yep uh right. it's gonna be interesting yeah he's also not in the next chapter either so yeah um I, so i i like this i just i glossed over it like the first two times i read it so i just wanted to pull it out the other trucks and vehicles were crowded around one of the case 53s was acting as a television projecting <laughs> signals onto the side of a truck i love powers yeah. <laughs> it's amazing I totally didn't like read that in my brain yeah so after after Sveta runs away in her hamster ball, she's joined by Egg, who's just a cool, cool dude. Love that guy. No, oh, it's so great. So great. But but seriously, though, it is great to see a version of him that's a little different from the one we saw last week. Right. Um, like th- this this version of him. He's got some underlying anger that's definitely there. But like they're also like messing around with him, like they're doing the cheek cheek kissing thing um, because that one European cape did it to him. And then everyone's kind of teasing him slash like making him feel better about it yeah um he's saying he never thought life could be this good he's so happy and we're seeing this person that is like so so different from the version of him we saw being total asshole to sveta and i think it's it's really great that we kind of get that before we go into this this last part of the chapter well especially i mean i it's very easy and tempting to hate egg but like if if you look at it from his point of view, she kind of did get all of his friends killed. Yeah. Like from his point of view. Like I don't yeah. I don't think that's fair, honestly, because they were the ones who attacked Weld and, and Sveta. But um Yeah. I mean but, blaming Sveta for that is uh, has about um as much bit into reality as blaming Sveta for her brother slipping on rocks. Right. <laughs> right? Like yeah. it's just I, I I agree, but like and, and I'm not I guess I'm not really defending. It's more like he is a, he is like a kid. And so it's kind of a realistic and it just makes me hate him a bit less to, to see it that way. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Yeah. So the crux of, of what he's trying to communicate is that he wants to make it clear that a sizable contingent of the irregulars want bloody retribution upon whoever in Cauldron can be held accountable. And they want Sveta to make sure that Weld is aware of this and that he plans on exacting that vengeance. And Sveta basically equivocates to him and then like, later kind of plays it off to herself and convinces herself that things will just work out. She doesn't really need to say anything and she can't really believe that her new friends would be violent. And then on top of all that, she just kind of trusts well to handle it. So yeah, basically she just packages together a bunch of justifications for inaction that seem fairly plausible, I guess from certainly from, from inside. Um, I, I think it is um, it, it is a horrible shock when when we actually see the the, the you know the irregulars turn on Weld, um, and and it's understandable that it would be a horrible shock to her. So um, but but like it, she definitely kind of makes this choice to to kind of turn away from what they're asking her to do. Yeah, yeah, and and like we talked about last week, we asked the question: Why does Egg blame Sveta? more than egg blames weld Mm -hmm. right and this is the answer yeah he came to her and he said this is what we're gonna do you're gonna talk to him right he's gonna know right and she said yeah yeah don't worry about it you're fine and she was wrong she was wrong she misled him on weld's um understanding of the situation and but but she was so confident weld is so good so perfect that he can stop this from happening. And she's wrong about that too. And, and, and I love that line. She was bloodier than all of them put together. And he changed her Mm -hmm. because this shows how her negative blame filled self image is influencing how she treats things. Mm -hmm. I am the worst. I am worse than all these people. And look, he made me good. And that's not the truth. We know that's not the truth. Sveta was good. Sveta always right. was good. Yeah. The, the core of her personality is a good person. He didn't do that to her. She did it. Right. And, and, and be, yeah. because of that, 
he puts that she she takes that away from herself. She doesn't give herself credit for that. She gives to someone else and she's wrong. And it's not that like it's not that Weld's a bad person. I'm not saying Weld's a bad, bad person. He's a guy that's trying his best in this whole thing. But she was wrong. And it's because of she can't get past this view of herself that she makes that error. Yeah, I think there's a lot to the, you know, speaking of, of their uh, of that discussion, we just saw them have. And, and he's basically saying um, I don't really feel like a good leader. Yeah. And, and instead of, instead of saying, why don't, why don't you tell me more about that? Well, why don't we talk yeah. about the idea? Why don't that we work on like, it? Yeah. yeah. She says, no, no, you are. You're the best leader. You're <laughs> right. the best you're, at everything. Yeah. You're the best at everything. And it's what it actually is, is a complete lack of communication. It, it, yeah. it she feels like she's being supportive. And in fact, he's just not being heard in his yeah. concerns. And in fact, he's right because maybe he's like clued into the fact that his, his, you know, team isn't all on the same page here. Yeah. And I think, I think that's where that, that conversation is that he feels like he feels like there's a disconnect here. Yeah. And yeah, you're absolutely right. He is correct in that. He's right. And she tells him, no, 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 no. She tells egg. No, 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 no. And she doesn't mean to do it. It's not like, like she's like consciously trying to manipulate these people. It's just, it's just because it's just like it's so mixed up in her sense of blame. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Um, so as this chapter ends, you know, it says the only trace of the conversation with Egg was a lingering feeling of something left unresolved. A deadline missed. Yep. Oops. Yep. <laughs> uh, so then we cut back to Sveta's transformation in progress with some fantastic body horror. Uh -huh. Like like this moment. The blister expanded, then, then unfurled, unzipped. A hundred pounds of flesh became a hundred pounds of pencil-thin tendril. Tendrils reached out and seized Mr. Bao. He's panicking, effervescent reported, an almost <laughs> ludicrous comment given the scene. Already, Thanks, Effie. <laughs> already Sveta was screaming in warning and alarm, her every instinct failing her. Victoria kicked in the glass door to the lab, her backup following her in. Um, just awesome. awesome. Well, and it's, pl it's playing into the thing that... I was convinced was going to happen right now. Yeah. Bao is going to be dead. She killed him. Uh, she, yeah. Okay. He, he made it worse. And then, yeah. and then she killed him. And now it's yeah. all, it's all as bad as it could possibly be. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, maybe I'm reading too much into this. Do you think this is like Sveta shard fighting back against the change? Like does Sveta shard want her to be tendril lady still? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I have no idea. I haven't thought about that at all, okay. but, uh, We'll think about it and get back to me. The powers definitely find a way, though. So They do. Um, yeah, so we cut briefly back to the bloody aftermath of the Irregulars attack on Cauldron, with Sveta recognizing the similarities between Victoria's body and the form of Eden. Yeah, which I don't know if that's something... Did the book ever make that distinction, or is that so. just something that's been talked about amongst the fans for years? I think that's, I think just, that's probably it. I think that's just been a fan thing. And, yeah. and now we finally have a character in this context where it, it makes sense for her to make that connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, I don't know if we ever, like, know if it actually means anything or, or if it will mean anything in the story. Like, I think there's there's a, there's some kind of suggestion um, that that Amy may have, like, shards you know you know shard memories or, or what have you like like she's basically doing the same thing that eden was doing when she was experimenting with her form and that's why it looks yeah. the same um but um but how that how that could tie into the story going yeah. forward does it mean yeah. does it mean anything else yeah i mean it seems interesting that we specifically make that textual yeah right now yeah. so maybe it will i don't know yeah and then this bit ends with Sveta thinking if there was one last thing to do, she would do what her hero would do and she would help however she could. <laughs> I love that because, again, the, the core of Sveta is heroic. But I also like she has to frame it in. It's Weld. Only, it's Weld, right? Yeah. yeah, it's just it's such a, it's like she's so she she glorifies him so much. It's like you're, you're a hero like without Weld, like your heroism isn't based on Weld, Sveta. I mean, he's great. I know I'm glad he helped you and I'm glad he's so great, but <sighs> yeah, it's an interesting thing that the story is doing here where like, I don't think it's uniformly harmful to have like, um, a hero, you know, no, to, to no. have like a, a, an idol, a personal, a personal, um, mentor, or someone you look up to. And we've talked actually a lot about how, how like, uh, Carol is simultaneously Victoria's like m hero and, person she can't stand at the same time 
which is cool. But uh, I don't know. I feel like the story has has more to say about this idea of, of hero worship, and th- this definitely seems to be not necessarily serving her uh, po- in a positive way. Although sometimes maybe it is. I don't want to be fully. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to fully condemn it. I mean, I I think there is definitely a truth to the fact that her, her relationship with Weld and Weld's guidance have helped her in tangible ways. I don't mm-hmm. want to take away from that, but I, I I just I just think it's interesting that like. In any given moment, we see here that she's pushing off, like she's pushing off her goodness on so, uh, on someone else. Like the reason I'm this way is not because of me; it is because someone else. And yeah, that's what I don't want to see. I want to I want to take let her take credit for herself a little bit. Yeah, I agree. So we then return to a later point in the surgery. Sveta's body having been mostly crafted, and we see her power manifest as an ability to split her arms into ribbons. And as the chapter ends, it, the text says. Then, tears welling in her eyes, she allowed herself to relax, to let down her guard and be vulnerable in a way she hadn't done for Weld around anyone in all the years she could remember existing, in all the vague years of her childhood she dreamed of. Nobody died as a consequence. Uh, that's such a wonderful end to a wonderful chapter. Yeah. Um, it's it's earned, it's emotionally impactful, it's powerful, it's kind of subversive. You don't expect things to work, to just work. Yeah. Um. And look, here's the thing. There are going to be consequences to this. I mean, not only is it a story, <laughs> it's a wild bow story. Right. Th- there will be consequences, whether it's going to be personal consequences, whether it's going to be um, this failing or Sveta going, like not getting what she wanted here or realizing that she's got other problems besides just her body, whether it's the rest of the case 53s out there who hate her, see this as an even more betrayal than they already did. Um, yeah. We we've got these open questions of how how Weld will react. We've got these open questions about like like we said, Mister Drowsing. Um, there's all these open things about this, but in this moment, right now, we're happy. Yeah. And and as we'll discuss in the next chapter, sometimes you got to take the win. Yeah. Right. We're happy because it's almost a best case scenario. Like like it looks. Right. It lo- it's looking like she's going to get a fully functional, uh, you know, human looking body and. The, and, and her power found a way to manifest in, in a way that's still very strong. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh, wow. Wow. Like, yeah. like there, there's no horrible catch here. Yeah. At least at, least at this point, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I, it, it's great. And it, in, in the midst of a, a very, very black arc, uh-huh. seems like some dawn is breaking. Ah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so black, probably one of my favorite arcs ever. Yeah, uh, uh, not even probably for me. Unquestionably, yeah. this is the best arc of the story. Um, I loved everything about it. I, I loved where it went. I loved where I didn't even know it was going to go. I mean, we did we did a freaking uh, like detective story in the middle of this story, and it worked. It worked really well. And we we looped it back to this this idea that we land the arc on on Sveta, and I it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Right. I mean, basically, the, most of this arc was me trying to do my, my typical summaries and just being like, I can't do this the proper way. I'm just going mm-hmm. to have to skip over things. I'm going to have to skip over big chunks of things that, that I have thoughts about and that we could talk about. But um, there's just so much density to what's going on. There's so much implication of what's going on behind, you know, behind the eyes of the characters who are speaking, but we don't necessarily we don't necessarily have you know enough information to to make a a firm conclusion so we just have to kind of yeah i don't know i love that arc so much yeah i mean like uh, we came off of heavens and heavens was an arc with a lot of interludes Mm -hmm. and i was very excited to go back to a normal arc with a normal amount of interludes because it meant that the chapters might not be as dense Um, and that didn't happen (laughs) yeah um so yeah i mean i i I think it's fantastic. It's fantastic writing. It's complex. It's challenging. It is emotional. It is doing everything. I think it succeeds at everything it's trying to do. Everything. Yeah. And um, it's moving us into a new phase of the story that I'm very interested in, in where we're going and what we're going to do. And I have no idea how far into the story we are, but it, it is definitely a, a, a migration <laughs> to a different part of the story. And mm-hmm. I can't wait. Yeah, me too. And as an example of that, uh, we talked about this one chapter for an hour and 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. So 
There you go. Wow. I mean, we've been wanting to talk. We've, we've been waiting for Sveta forever. So We have. We yeah. have. We have. So let's move into this next arc, 14, Breaking, Chapter 1. And Vic, we start out with Victoria being ambushed by Darnall as she does her physical therapy. She passively notes that Darnall either looks like a movie dad or like a calculating mastermind. <laughs> Those are two very different types of people, uh-huh. <laughs> Matt. Um, do you think do you think Victoria assumes like he's putting on an affect here in some ways like the the friendly dad is like is he playing his own version of good cop bad cop with I'm, his patients you know I, I mean my honest read is that like he's he's just a complicated person where he's trying to be nice and, and sympathetic most of the time and then every once in a while um like has to put on his psychologist hat and like think around the person and and try to like outmaneuver them basically and then he looks like yeah. a calculating mastermind when he does that so that's fair um I, I i don't i don't read any sinister motives into into darnell so no i don't either and by the end of this chapter i, I really love him so yeah yeah um, i've been pretty mixed on him up until this point but i really like him so yeah yeah so i mean basically we're beginning this arc with victoria you know touching base with herself and that, that that's kind of it's kind of how these arcs have been have been starting recently. Um, so, you know, for example, she's she's doing her PT. Uh, she turns she returns her attention to her, her uh, workout partner Ethan, who is drilling her. Uh, I mean, uh, drilling sparring techniques with her. Are you gonna are you gonna do that all arc? <laughs> no, I just had to get it out of my system. Okay. I okay. mean, there might be a few more. Not gonna lie. Okay, good, because I am. <laughs> Uh, so I almost completely glossed over this thing where Ethan is pushing her to attack without thinking, and she's in a very Victoria fashion, pausing to process his instructions before executing. And there's a specific exchange where he says, I want you to do it instinctively while fighting better. And this is kind of deep because to my mind, like all behavior change arises from doing a thing slowly and deliberately until it becomes automatic and instinctive. Um, and, and so it's just this interesting kind of clash between their two kind of philosophies here. Yeah, and I... I hadn't thought of that, but you brought it out and it kind of informed my view on this whole chapter because I think we're in a new arc now. Remember, this is chapter one of a new arc. The story is shifting um, and we're kind of setting up and defining our themes of the arc. And I like that as one of them. Victoria hit a low point last arc, but the success with Sveta's surgery has, it seems, made things better. And she might be moving into a different phase of her recovery, possibly a bit, mm-hmm. maybe. Um, and part of that is pushing herself to new experiences and to allow herself to do new things. And maybe this idea of learning to um, take her scholarly, you know, book nerdy person and, and channel that into instinctive behavior will help her in that path. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I definitely think we're framing the um, the philosoph- the, the philosophical you know battleground for the for the story here. Yeah, for the for, yeah. the, for the arc. So, um, speaking of high minded philosophy, Victoria gets a glimpse of Ethan's <laughs> tummy, and then she uh, mo- she mind um, shower PG thirteens him. <laughs> um, but like being able to do that really means a lot to her even like to just barely dip into a basically healthy fantasy is like a, a thing that she almost like grasps onto and kind of refuses to, to leave. Yeah. And it takes her a while to get there. Right. She really struggles with it. And in a classic Victoria way, she takes like six paragraphs to get to, we did some stuff in the shower together in my head movies. Yeah. But I love it. Like I really love that not only that she's able to get here and then she gives herself credit for getting there. Even if, even if her victory is just a little woo, Mm -hmm. I I did it. I think it's so great. And going back to what you just talked about with the fighting moves, she's not at a point where she can just go and act on instinct, right? She has to, this is dangerous, triggering, dark territory she's in and she needs to be careful and she needs to reason through her mind's process around this. But maybe, just like Ethan is teaching her to act a little bit more on instinct in her fighting, maybe he can teach her, teach her to act a little more instinctually on this, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. I mean, they should fuck. Mm-hmm, totally. That's what, yeah. that's what they should do. They, they should, yeah. Um, so her physio gets mad at her for not attending her sessions, says that doing the homework diligently does not make up for it because the homework needs to be adjusted to track with her progress. And in fact... 
doing the homework blindly, maybe hurting her. <laughs> I love this because like Victoria is such a good student, right? She's a student that does every single bit of homework you assign to her. But like the one that if you ask her to like come to you in class and talk to you, mm-hmm. uh, she won't ever do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's and, and we see that in both sides of her therapy, right? We we see it in her physiotherapy and we see it in her mental health therapy as well. And I, I, I think it's great. She's yeah. such a, it's a little, I just remember like the first bit of Victoria we got in this entire book was her getting rejected from school Yeah, and like, she loves school. She <laughs> loves homework. Yeah. She likes the system. Yeah. Yeah. So the physiotherapist advises Victoria to snap Ethan up because obviously she notices the staring and heavy breathing. <laughs> uh, but I'm sure that combat thinker Annalise, who can probably see with his eyes closed, uh, missed it somehow. Yeah, totally. I wonder if he's like walking off like, yes, yes, right. yes, yes. I really look forward to the, I mean, like we, we're joking around about this a lot and I think it's cause it's funny and it's light and it's, it's like refreshing to see Victoria, like maybe start to move into this, this, uh, thing a uh-huh. little bit, but, um, I, I think it's, I think she's got a long way to go, but it's, it's fun. I re- I, I enjoy it. I enjoy yeah. seeing her maybe may take some steps in this direction. Yeah, yeah, me too. So the physio gives her some more stress balls, and she takes an old woman with horn-rimmed glasses and a fish with bulging eyes. Well, she picks the fish, though. She picks, she pick, picks the fish. She doesn't choose the horny, I mean, the horn-rimmed glasses. <laughs> um, and you for those analyze of you, this? Well, for those, no, I'm not going to. I, I thought about doing it for a hot second, and I was like, no, but... The, the thing she's picked so far are a lion, a bird, and now a fish, right? Uh-huh. Um, is, 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 this, uh, is this important? It's probably not. It's probably not important. But I am now going to insist that this arc is all about Byron because she picked a fish. Okay. So that's what I'm doing. Sounds good. Uh, Donal approaches and tries to get some of her time, and Vicky insists on getting a shower in first. I like the moment that I really appreciate in this is that like Darnall walks up and says, you know, you've been missing appointments with me and you've been missing appointments with your physiotherapist. And Victoria's like, she told you. And he's like, no, I just know you now. (laughs) (laughs) I shouldn't have to tell me. I know that you're missing your appointments. Yeah. Got her. Got her. That's great. Yeah. You've, 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 uh, let, let on. Yeah. Yeah. So on her way to the shower, she stops by Sveta who's doing crunches um, basically this is just good writing. We, we don't, we, 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 we you know, it, it says, uh, the, the first, the first thing we see about Sveta is Sveta was doing crunches, arms out straight and pressed together like she was diving. So like the writing is basically shoving right up front. Hey, arms, crunches, full body mobility. Like, like it doesn't, there, this, the text doesn't like slowly approach this. It's just, yeah. bam, there's Sveta. She's in the gym like a normal person. It's great. Yeah. And when we last left her, like her body wasn't complete. Like she it was described as similar to side piece a little bit. Yeah. Um, but now the body is complete. Um, it is fully, it is great. It is perfect. It is everything. Um, and she is so happy to be working out. Yeah. I need to channel Sveta's joy when I work out because <laughs> I'm never that happy. That's a good point. Yeah. Just be thankful for your body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sveta has also been decorating her body with a marker. So this, this is fun too. This interaction where uh, she said, or Victoria says, you're out of shape. I've never been in shape. <laughs> and um, she's so delight. Like you can imagine her saying that in yeah. like with such pleasure and happiness. I right. love it. Right. Let's talk about the tattoos a little bit. Yeah. I, I think this is really great. I like she, Sveta decorated her artificial body and tattoos as a way of making it more her, right? Um, artwork is very important to her, and so she's decorating herself. And I'm really kind of happy this trend is continuing with her new body. We get, like, a hint that she's, like, planning out – she's using a marker and she's planning out what is going to eventually be permanent tattoos on her arms. Um, and we talked a lot of last chapter about this idea that maybe she's, like – going to be chasing that girl that she used to be to an unhealthy level. But this to me is like an indication that maybe she's okay being this version of that girl, right? Like that, that she's going to, she's going to combine the time she had in, in that artificial body with those tattooed sleeves with, uh, with who that person was and, and combine these into a healthy balance of who I was and who I am now. Um, yeah, maybe I'm just maybe I'm just really wanting Sveta to be OK. Well, there's <laughs> definitely I mean, anything. there's nothing alarming in this chapter. There, there's, yes. there's no moment of like, 
foreboding in this chapter. So, yeah. so I, I think I don't think you're wrong to to, to be thinking in that direction. Yeah. Um. But it speaking is, of which, it, <laughs> what? Well, the the next the next line here. Oh, oh yeah, the next line. Um, I, I abandoned Sveta to her happy hell. <laughs> Look, I don't think this is saying anything like there's there's nothing there's nothing here besides just the the basic read that Sveta is getting her ass worked. Yeah. Like, like she's she's really working out. And, and this personal trainer is like, like, really, I'm trying not to use sexual innuendo here. And it's really <laughs> hard, actually. Um, but uh, she's she's uh, she's like working out really hard. Yeah. And um she's enjoying it. She's loving every bit of it. And that's all it means. But like, I'm so in the back of my head, I'm so ready and I'm so in something is going to go wrong with Sveta mode that like any kind of wordplay that, that might indicate something bad is going to happen, like triggers me. Uh And like anytime the book like has Victoria, like not be in the same scene as scene as Sveta and leave the scene with, with like something like that. I'm like, Oh my God, she's the next time she's going to see her. She's going to be in terrible and everything's going to have gone wrong. And it's like, I'm I'm freaking out, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the same page. I mean, I I definitely uh, hesitated on that line, but I did. I also ended up just saying like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, that's Victoria's thought. That's not the text. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's, that's not yeah. that's not the that's not the narrator. <laughs> it's it's clever wordplay that is yeah. not supposed to indicate anything about Sveta's mental state or anything. Yeah, yeah. Other than she's wonderfully happy. Yeah, right, right. Um, this is a this is a bit of a tangent, but like, did you do you visualize um that like she's like a changer now? Like her arms are like normal arms, and then they like transform into being made out of ribbons, or do you think like the ribbons are like her arms are just made out of ribbons and they just look really good. Oh, that's a good question. I, I kind of envisioned that that they just look like normal arms and then the unzipping. Like in in arm form, they look like normal arms. That was my vision. I, I, I also envision them looking like normal arms, but I guess, and maybe this is a distinction without a difference. It's like, are they normal arms that turn into ribbon arms or are they normal looking arms that are composed out of tightly compressed ribbons? I don't know. It, it, I, I think it's that. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I do too. Um, it doesn't really matter, actually. But I think I, the I, important I part wondering. is that yeah, the important part is that in her normal form, they look like arms. Yeah, I think I agree. indistinguishable from. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so while Victoria takes her shower, she avoids thinking about Annalise, and it's <laughs> it's around this point that Victoria lets us know that she hasn't been able to. And then I just wrote in the notes uh, euphemism for masturbate because I didn't like want to 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 spend a lot of time on that. Um, so I I w- was trying to get you to say some euphemism for masturbating, and I thought it'd be really funny, but I decided not to. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, just fill it in with your own favorite, you know. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go. There's way more ones for dudes than there are for girls. It's not fair. I, it's really not. We should we work on that. Me. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really funny here though that the, in the middle of the shower she's like. Oh, no, I can't go down this line of thinking. Got to focus on the intense, complex political cape situation to avoid thinking about sex, which is like the opposite of what. (laughs) Let me run away to politics to avoid thinking about sex. Yeah, it's it's so it's so Victoria. I love it. Yeah, Um, I I think I think the 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 specific mention of the masturbation um, is a little bit further down. I think it's when she's thinking when she's talking to Darnall specifically, but I think that is really important. This idea that like, she's not even like she once got to a place where she thought maybe I could handle this myself. And that even that like fucked her up yeah. where she just started bawling. Um, yeah. And it's just like, she's so, so far from being but, able to handle this kind of thing. Yet. But, but that was a while ago. Right? That was a year ago. That was it a was year a year ago. ago. Yeah. yeah. So but she's terrified. Is like, I couldn't handle that by myself. I don't want to, I don't want to yeah. cry in front of <laughs> another dude. Right. Just, even if, even if he says he's cool. Yeah. Get, get some fresh trauma cooked up. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. So she, she joins Darnall and they have a, a look at her mental health journal and it's um, like, it was almost comical the way she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm a little frustrated to be honest. And then she hands him his this journal that's just like, I, I imagine it's like covered in drawings of like blackness and blood and looming darkness and minuses and like creepy eyes peeking out between cracks of things everywhere. 
Uh, and she does say that it gradually relaxes over time, but like it's 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 like if someone's you know hands you a copy of Johnny the Homicidal Maniac and they're like, mm-hmm. here's some light reading. Yeah, this would definitely be the kind of journal that would get you sent to the principal's office <laughs> in middle school for sure. Yeah, right, right, right. Not that I'm speaking from experience or anything. <laughs> um, no, but I, I, I really do like this. Like we see her, how her mood shifts and like the day after the entire last arc took place, she drew a black circle. And since then, it's gotten a little bit better. A bit, a little, a bit better. Yeah. Yeah, not not a ton. I mean, that, that, that's why it was kind of comical to me. It's like yeah. you, you can imagine her like kind of pertly handing this journal over to Darnall and then just him like slowly paging through looking <laughs> at these pictures. It's like, oh, my God, you needed to be seeing me every day right. during this time. Yes. Yep. Um, I, I love I love this. She she kind of draws a, 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 a figure for how she thinks the future days are going to be. And she describes it as blood because of the imminent surgeries because teacher and because that had been the day i'd had to pass under the shadow of my sister thanks to those tattoos of hers thanks to that fucking selfish symbology that was supposed to represent me with suns and my face in silhouette thanks most of all to the color red that stained her arms from finger to elbow and whoever knew how much else she was that bloody looming specter it's wonderful i i like it a lot yeah and i mean i i i the idea that like once again, we have this light imagery with the suns and it's attached to something negative around Victoria, not positive. You know, like th- this, the, the, the arc title is breaking. It's almost like the da- dawn is breaking, like w- it was black and now dawn is breaking. But there's still so much negative connotation surrounded by light with in this book that I, I like it a lot. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I, I, the, the, the fact that the sun is mentioned here, I think, is, is very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Ha- have we ever talked about how like Victoria's favorite person and Victoria's least favorite person are both really into like uh, symbolic sleeve tats. No, I think that's pretty funny. It, it, yeah, it is. It is interesting. Um, I, I I don't know what to make of it other than um, maybe those two characters do have more similarities than Victoria would ever admit. Because I mean, Amy yeah. was her best friend for most of her life, actually. Yeah, and and like it, it I, you would think that like the things that would make her feel close to Sveta might overlap with the things that, that, that she likes about Amy. But, but she, again, she would have a hard time admitting that to herself. Yeah. It's interestingly enough, a parallel that I've never really spent time investigating, but I think there's something there. There's probably going to be some similarities, um, and overlaps in that. And I think that that'll be interesting if, if it's explored later. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Now I'm thinking about other wild characters that have sleep fats too, but <laughs> uh, that's not for this podcast. So I wanted to talk about, some of those later diary entries too. Sure. <laughs> because on the third day, a black circle, but with silver like gaps, I'd drawn eyes in the gaps. I'd elaborated around in what I intended as rays of the sun on the fourth, the same idea, but the eyes were larger and there was less black. I realized now I'd invoked the wretch with so many eyes and with the rays radiating out, having frayed ends like wavy reaching arms, fingers extending out. So that's a lot of very specific imagery. Uh huh. Like the thing that really got me was this idea that like it's darkness and then behind the darkness there's eyes. Right. Like what? I, and I didn't even. I'm not. Wasn't even sure what to make of that. Like, what do you think she's trying to channel there? I don't know. And I think it's fascinating that the text doesn't doesn't tell us at all. Like, yeah. like sometimes she tells us what she's thinking with the symbols. Here right. with the eyes, she she does not. Yeah, she she specifically says the rays of the sun, the wavy lines are trying to be the rays of the sun. So it's kind of like the sun coming from behind the darkness, but within that there's these eyes that she drew and and made bigger like this like uh, that she feels seen or she feels watched or like yeah i mean it could be i think it could be the fact that they know teachers watching them um yeah you know this just popped into my mind but um this thing that she's drawn looks a lot like what i imagined um 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 scapegoats vision of teachers kind of shard aura to look like Oh, where, where it's like a it's like a, a gr- grasping creature of like a thousand a thousand grasping appendages which which is I, I don't remember if it had eyes or not specifically um but yeah it definitely like evokes kind of the the dark energy of of teachers um teachers presence absolutely cool yeah that's my answer it's teacher <laughs> i like it 
So Donal encourages her to indulge a bit in the positive emotions associated with Sveta's recovery. He wants her to recognize the win, and she's basically unable to because she's worried that it won't end well. And this, especially on the reread, this really kicked me into this whole meta uh, line of thought because I think this is this is actually meta in a really good good way because we're also like like we we are also worried that this doesn't end well. In fact. Yeah. We're almost sure it doesn't because we've been conditioned, just like Victoria, to not recognize the win. And yeah, you know, we just talked about how it felt good for a moment when, when you know, when Sveta got her, her body fixed. We feel good for a moment when the bad guys get defeated. But we know the next bad thing is coming. It, it's a story. And more specifically, it's a wild bow story. And more <laughs> specifically, it's a parahuman story. Um, but here we have a character in the story who has been conditioned the same way we have. So maybe the point here is that sometimes things actually are okay. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that a lot. I'm not sure if that's the intent, but I do agree that the text is really using our feelings against us a little bit here. Like that, I, I feel like Wildbo has enough of a grasp of his writing that he knows what his readers are thinking in these moments. And we are all waiting for this other shoe to drop. Right. And, and he's channeling that into this entire conversation I think there is the meta, the meta commentary is absolutely here. And I, I want to believe you're right. I want to believe that one of the images there, the messages of this, the story is, Hey, sometimes, sometimes it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, and I think, I think that's definitely the case here that, that, oh, that Darnell is making a case that, Look, tomorrow's tomorrow, man. Like we, we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. It could be bad. It could be good. Um, but take the win today. Like just take it. Like and and don't lessen your win today because tomorrow might be bad. Um, he says specifically, all you can do is be there. If tragedy is in store, being close will let you help more. If there's only more joy, then you lose nothing. And I think that's a beautiful sentiment. That's one of the reasons why I like this guy so much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I what, adore that. Yeah. What motivated Victoria to go through with this, this whole thing, what to, to, to kind of break with her own rules, to, to work with monsters, um, to work with bio tinkers, to do all these things is this overwhelming feeling that I'm not making a difference. I'm not doing anything. I'm not fixing anything. We're just surviving. We're not fixing anything. And now Sveta is fixed. It could get worse. It could backfire. There could be tragedy here. But you got to take the win. Like you, you yeah. made a choice. You decided to do something. Let yourself have it. Let yourself. You fixed. You helped her. You did it. Let yourself have that. And it doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. I mean, it does. But well. We, we've had this this notion recently with Victoria where she's like, I just want to fix something, you know, right. uh, I just I just want to I, I, I'm, I'm tired of everything being like a compromise. I just want to fix it. And then we move on with it fixed. And and the thing is, you're exactly right. She she basically I mean, she, she spearheaded this. Right. She kind of I don't want to say pushed, but she she got this to happen. Yeah. And it, and Sveta is, quote unquote, fixed. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I want to put quotes around it. Sveta's happy with where she She's is. Fixed. She's fixed. Yeah. So take the damn, take the damn W, um, yeah. Victoria. If, so, if, you're, yeah. if your complaint is that nothing ever gets fixed, and then when something gets fixed, you're like, well, is it really fixed? Right. Then <laughs> what do you do to yourself? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I, I, and I love this, th this thing he says, if the emotions are positive, can they really hurt someone? Um, and I think that's a really great counter. I, I love that. Yeah. That, that's good yeah um and i think it's true so a bit later they meet up with the team who are like 35 percent dressed in their costumes uh we get this fascinating scene where everyone is just terribly depressed and morose and ashley is completely horrible to everyone uh, and then uh, they go inside and we realize that it was all an act yeah and I, I, I just compressed a lot of text but i love this whole bit part yeah i i, I think it's great that we talk about this as a whole though because i think it's important the 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 dressed in costumes part. I think that that was really interesting as like maybe a symbol of everyone's how everyone's doing relative to each other. Right. Yeah. Like that, that we're all kind of in different, different stages of being in our costumes. Um, we're all in kind of different stages and, in, in how we're doing. I liked that a lot. 
Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's specifically what it was doing, but that really jumped out to me. That's interesting. I, I sort of read it as part of their act, like acting like everyone's just falling apart. They can't even be bothered to put their costumes on. But um, yeah, I, liked I, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to like um, who, who was more dressed up versus who, who, who else, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So. But th- this is brilliant. <laughs> Let's, I yeah. mean, th- this, this is, is brilliant. And, and once like, I think like your meta commentary with Darnall telling her to have a win, I think this is playing into what everyone that reading the story is thinking right now. Like this, this idea like that, Hey, good things are for Sveta, but fuck you uh-huh. now things are bad for everyone else ashley's a fucking jerk again she's treating rain like shit and yelling at people on a train which is exactly what happened <laughs> at the beginning of the story tristan and byron are fighting again um there's this idea that like the breakthrough is a bunch of spinning plates and if you fix the wobble in one all the other ones are going to start wobbling and you're just like fuck yeah <laughs> you're just like shit yeah why why does this have to happen now is is anything ever going to be good and then you realize that it was an act the, the 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 reveal happens a perfectly done reveal this is where she goes okay but how do you really feel yeah um and you're just like the wave of relief oh. is so wonderful <laughs> yeah like, oh thank god right. ashley ashley <laughs> although it's it's definitely a risky uh move to to basically put everyone in a situation where it's like just pretend to be backsliding yeah yeah I mean, that's what the, that's what the chapter kind of ends on is, is this consolation that this is not a good long term plan. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, the interesting subsequent bit is that uh, they all did end up with slightly hurt feelings like we were implying, like Byron mentions that he interested and had a fake fight that hit a little too close to home. Yeah. And so what we're doing here is we're taking um, a team of parahumans in recovery and forcing them to pretend like they're the way they were before yeah to fall back into their their old ways their worst instincts and that's bad (laughs) and like i I love how victoria takes that and expands the scope out she's like if this is happening to my guys let's look around at everyone else every other team is probably going through something similar every single hero right now is pretending like uh, they're falling apart and this kind of goes back to this kind of thing that we've talked about in these stories before this idea that if you pretend to be something for long enough you just start being it and and i think that's where we're we're calling that theme again here but in the negative now yeah and there's it's great structurally because it like puts a a a ticking clock on this this move against teacher but also like you're just so worried like it's weird that the story manages to make you terrified for your characters um you're so so relieved that that was an act but then immediately after that, it's like, okay, yeah, that was an act, but I'm, uh, I, he did kind of hurt my feelings a right. little bit. My Tristan did hurt me a little bit. You're just like, fuck. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> I, I mean, behavior and cognition are like this Ouroboros where it's like impossible to say where does it start, and yeah. and if you behave, if you behave in a way that is consistent with your worst um, thoughts, then you're going to have those thoughts. Yep. And and yep. it's going to and then you're just going to backslide. You, yep. It almost makes you wonder if this is teacher's plan. Like it, it could be. It could be. Yeah. I mean, the arc is called breaking. And yes, it could be the breaking of of the dawn, the, the Twilight book. But <laughs> our team's called Breakthrough. Yeah. And they could be breaking, too. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. So as Breakthrough approaches the bunker, we understand that this is all part of the scheme. And the plan is to raid teacher's headquarters. It's been a whole arc without a lot of cape fighting. We're going to do some fighting. Yeah. I you, think. Do you think we do you think we saved up all of the cape fighting from last arc uh, to, to happen here? Um, I don't know if it's quite going <laughs> to go out that <laughs> not, way. Not, but not literally, but yeah. yeah. I, I think there's good, I think it's going to be a heavy action arc. Yes. Okay. If, if, if that's the question you're asking, yeah. then yes. yes I suspect I it will be too. Yes. All right. Let's do some discussion of the uh, responses to the, to the discussion question last week. So the previous week's question was, should Sveta go through with it? Why or why not? And of course, we know that she did, but that's not the question we were asking. That's not the question we were asking. We were also not asking if you're entitled to make that decision for her. Mm-hmm. You're not. We know that. <laughs> we know it's, that. 
it's it's just a hypothetical. It's just hypothetical. All right. So Megafire considers the wider implications of Sveta's decision on the K63 community. They already despise her, and this could escalate things into active, aggressive hostility. Which K63s will want to do this? Which won't? Megafire also notes that Bao and Drowsing are about to be exiled, so will Sveta be the first and only K63 to be fixed this way? So not only did Sveta take away their opportunity for revenge, but it's also possible that she found their cure and then took that away too. Are these things Sveta should be worrying about when making her choice? Probably not. But there are things someone should be worrying about before Sveta makes whatever decision she makes. I liked that a lot. I like this idea that like, I especially liked his link to um, Sveta already being the person who took away their opportunity for revenge and now could be seen as taking the cure away too. I I, I think that's, I think that's great. Yeah. I didn't spend a lot of time at all thinking about what the other, what the other uh, K-53s would think, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Penguin chooses to frame the question as if Sveta came to her and asked her for some, some advice. And she says, no, she should not go through with it. Sarah Penguin says the risks are far too high with a group of capes that are just not trustworthy enough. Sarah Penguin says, I think she should wait for a trustworthy cape who will be around for maintenance and whose power we know more about before letting people mess with a body like that. But as I said, she is an adult and she can do whatever she likes with her body. Yeah, I like that. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, the the, the, like the idea of maintenance is something we've seen with um, Bonesaw and um, Ashley for sure. Right. Right. And yeah, we we don't know like about like what's going to happen with orchard now, right? Like they were promised some concessions. Um, are they in the prison dimension now? No, it's been almost a week. So did yeah. they, are they, they already been dropped in there and they're gone now. Good no. question. I don't know. Culinero, Culinero 985 gives a whole bunch of reasons why Sveta should absolutely go through with the procedure, including bodily autonomy, no moral objections to using orchard this way, uh, but then throws an absolute curveball and says, no, Sveta should not go through with it. And they say, Sveta is in the middle of one of the worst days of her recent life. She's been through a traumatizing breakup and is in, in the midst of other superpower manipulation attempts hitting society at large and also had a particular, particularly shitty encounter with other C-53s. Choosing to get a new body is totally valid. Choosing to do that today on your worst day, maybe not advisable. If she were a real person seeking my advice, I'd really recommend she sit on, sit on it for a few days or even a few weeks before pulling the trigger. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, I would... I mean, she does sit on it for a few days, basically, but uh, I... It's like a day, like, right? Well, um, I don't remember now. Yeah, it's pretty like quick. It's, like a day. it's pretty quick, yeah. Um, I thought it was I thought it was, a, I thought it was like four days at most, which is, which I agree. I think a few weeks maybe would be more appropriate. Yeah, I think, I think a general rule of life should be never make a permanent decision on the day uh, you, you're, you break up with someone. Right, yeah. You wouldn't get a tattoo on the day you get, you, you get dumped, then uh, don't uh, alter your entire body uh, using magical alien technology either yeah that's and that's something we can all live by i agree all right data 669 says the flip side of defiance point that you can be sorry even when wholly justified your actions is that sometimes you can make a really stupid decision and just get lucky even if feta accepts the offer everything goes well and she winds up in a perfectly functional body with no complications that won't change the fact that victoria should have asked her first rather than going behind her back or the fact that this is an incredibly risky idea and there's an uncomfortably high probability of her ending up dead or worse I, yeah. I like this idea of like you can fuck up and get lucky <laughs> like yeah. the, and and that could be what happened here right. right like she shouldn't have made this decision but it worked out yeah this could have been a bad decision yeah and, and I like the idea of kind of bringing Victoria into it and saying like you know Victoria you you're think how bad you would have felt if if this hadn't you know that setting Sveta aside entirely how how horrible Victoria would have felt if it hadn't worked out oh it would have broken her absolutely yeah, yeah. That was that was another risk that was on the table. Yeah, Kyrgyzstan says no, 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 and they argue that you should never play a game where you can't afford to lose, no matter how big the prize. Wow, I I love that framing. Mm-hmm. The the potential outcome if the procedure goes poorly is just something that Kyrgyzstan believes Sveta cannot afford. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really clear and succinct way of putting that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Chariago says, from a moral standpoint, yes. From a risk standpoint. Still, yes. And they, unlike Kyrgyzstan, think that the risk 
that the the risk is generally outweighed by the potential reward. Sveta has to go above and beyond to keep her tendrils from hurting everyone, and in a situation without her prosthetic body or rain emotion power, she could very easily end up killing people she cares about. She also lives in a world where people actively seek out and hurt Case 53s, and with parahuman resentment growing every day, a Case 53 is a very dangerous thing to be. And so, so Chariago just thinks that, that it's clear that the benefits outweigh yeah. any of those right. those risks. As we've discussed, utilitarianism is a useless tool because the answer changes depending on how far out you zoom. <laughs> uh, me from You're Mars. not going to get any comments about that at all. <laughs> no, that's, that's going to pass without remark. Uh, me from Mars made a really cool chart, basically a two by two chart. Uh, where on the one axis it's fix her body later ver- versus fix her body ASAP, um, and then the, the other axis being fix her body versus fix her body with Mr. Bao. And basically they say, yeah, she should fix her body and she should fix her body later. This is something Svet has wanted for a long time, and the right combination of powers in the right situation, uh, you go for it if that, if that arises. Uh, fix her body ASAP. Um, who knows? You know, th- th- there's wh- why rush. I guess is basically what he what he's saying in this quadrant. Yeah. And then fix your body later. Ace. Uh, sorry, sorry. Fix your body later with Mister Bao. Maybe we don't know enough to say wh- like whether he's like the best person to do this. We know he's a criminal who the wardens are gonna exile, and like presumably she could come to you know get him out of the prison dimension later and do this later. And then fix her body ASAP with Mr. Bao. Definitely not. We don't know enough about his powers. She's had a terribly rough day. Her support structures have been whittled away, and this might not be the solution that she wants. Yeah, well, there we go. So basically, like, no. (laughs) I'm a sucker for charts, guys. Yeah, me too. All right, next up we have Muns for College who says, I'd say no, because she just heard about this opportunity right now and isn't even being shown any secondary options that don't involve putting your life in the hands of monster supervillains. They say this isn't like a, a trans person transitioning where it's a gradual and kind of well understood and laid out progress. Go through the regimen of HRT, get surgery, etc. This promises to be some some kludgy parahuman Frankenstein shit. So um, I think Muns for College is kind of rejecting the metaphor a little bit there and saying that this is not the same. It doesn't line up the same. So you can't compare those choices. Um, and I, I'm kind of inclined to agree with him on that part, at least um, this idea that like, like this is such unknown. Like yeah. it's, no, we'd have no idea how this is going to work. If it's going to work, what's going to happen? Like how do you properly gauge the risks if you don't even know what those are? Right. Yeah. It's, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's a risky surgical procedure. It's a procedure that's never been done before. Right. Right. And yeah, right. Uh, PD Enigma says he's not sure, but also goes ham on Victoria. He <laughs> says it's utterly wrong for Victoria to do this. Such a terrible fucking idea. I wanted to smack Victoria through the screen. Victoria has always taken the path of most trauma in Ward, and it's entirely unnecessary. There are a thousand ways for this to go wrong, and one way for it to go right, and every single way hurts Victoria. What the fuck, Vicky? Might as well go to Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch, PETA. Damn. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I kind of see what they mean here, though, because like this idea that like whether or not Sveta decides she wants to go through us or not, like Victoria's decision to go down this route and present this up uh, as an opportunity is incredibly, like you said, is incredibly risky to her well-being as well. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you know, worth mentioning, Amy could have done this lickety split, right? Like, mm-hmm. like we know that for a fact. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Ananiad, who um, who does connect Case 53s to uh, the transgender experience. And then with that metaphor in mind says, yes, Sveta should do it. At least some of the Case 53s experience dysphoria, hatred and disconnect with their bodies. Is it fair to expect them just to learn to live with the constant feeling when solutions exist out there? Should they feel the potential consequences to be worth it? Of course not. We wouldn't try to tell a trans person not to have their body modified to fit their identity. So in my opinion, nobody should tell Sveta not to seek out this either, regardless of the risks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, that, that it is, it is interesting to see the, the trans, transgender um, analogy applied there. And, and I yeah. think that that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Lost Man 138 says, yes, regardless of the risk, after all the crap she's gone through, she should get a body if she wants one. Also, 
uh, they're thinking ahead. Of, sorry, also is thinking ahead a bit. If the former irregulars try to pull something, a policy of friendly fire should be in effect because screw them. All they've ever done throughout the story is shit on Sveta. So yeah, I just to kill those guys. <laughs> Last yeah. man says. Yeah. Cool. Uh, inconspicuous germ says yes. They say uh, if Sveta says no. Inconspicuous germ does not see a road that towards a better normal that exists out there. There's not really a road she can find to have a better normal. She could find another bio manipulator, but basically all other options are about as good an idea as Mr. Bao. Chris likely wouldn't do it. Amy is a hard no. And the tinker and suit solutions only get her so far. Her best option would be to try to live a life of a heroine along with her best bud, Victoria, as they both fail to find good follow-ups for their exes. A Case 53 relationship would likely be right out, and her anatomy is just too weird for a human relationship to last in any meaningful way. That leaves her the only meaningful that leaves her with the only meaningful path forward as one with a biomanipulator right in front of her. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's interesting because uh, at this point, you know, we've we've gone through enough of these that you, you see a lot of the same themes, um, mm-hmm. and and it's like, yeah, I, I think that there's, I think that the people who so far, you know, the people saying, uh, yeah, maybe, but but not with this guy, uh, definitely have a point, but but uh, in, inconspicuous germ has a point here that like there's not really any guarantee you're gonna find a better bio manipulator. Yeah, like what which. Okay, this guy's a monster. He's terrible. He can do it, but no. Okay, who? So who? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I mean, we were just talking about Amy, but like, it's really obvious why they're not going to go to Amy. Yeah, so, obviously. I yeah. think that is. I mean, Victoria like drew an Amy figure in her diary just because on the day she went to a bio ticker was like close to Amy orbited, yeah. and it like it it really impacted her so going to amy no no way no freaking way yeah right uh call me silent says no victoria is so involved in all this uh to the point where she's behaving opposite to the way she normally does so the risk for sveta is not just destroying herself but destroying her friend and they say i think victoria's attempt to push past her trauma in order to to do something for sveta is causing her to ignore a ton of red flags about the, about the particular situation because she basically has to ignore a hundred internal red flags just to be able to talk to Orchard. So she is also blind to the ones that are just inherent to the situation. Yeah, I mean that's that's really well said. Let, like Victoria is the last person to be involved in this particular situation. I think I think is is a really excellent point. Like, yeah, in, in the same way that Sveta shouldn't be making this decision on like the worst day of her life, Victoria shouldn't be the one being like her advocate for getting bio tinker surgery. Yeah, but and, and there's I mean the other half of this I like is this idea that like the consequences to Victoria should they be in Sveta's mind as she's trying to make this decision? Because as we said, if if this fails, Sveta is not the only one here that is going to be destroyed. Yeah. Right. Uh, Victoria will absolutely blame herself for this. And and I don't know if she'd be able to recover from it. Yeah. So uh, there's a point that maybe that should be under consideration when you're weighing the risks and benefits of this thing. Yeah. Yeah. True. Uh, next up is Hobo Demon, who brings up a potential risk factor that I hadn't seen elsewhere. The idea of psychological rejection. If Sveta's new body feels off, then it could be almost as bad as not having a body at all. Only she'd have meta feelings of shittiness because of what Victoria et al. have gone through to give her the opportunity to have a body. I like that a lot. Like this idea that like, oh, this doesn't feel right. And everyone looks at me and sees, oh, you got your body. We did it for you. But no, it's yeah, something that doesn't it, feel right. Yeah, and this, how, isn't, this isn't my body. This is a yeah. weird alien thing that was given to me. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can kind of relate to that, actually. Um, that's and that's also something Victoria kind of experienced um, this yeah. idea that that like she got her quote unquote body back, but it's like made out of rodents and she like hates it still mm-hmm. basically. Like she yeah. still has this, this for it, even though it's, even though it is her normal body. Yep. Uh, TVC grid says, no, they say, um, I know the potential upside feels very positive, but there's also positives in, in continuing to have her body. She has developed such a fine grain control that she can be friendly and casual among her teammates and can express herself through her art. That's a hard earned skill, but slowly over time. And she has close relationships with others that have developed trust. These should be sources of pride, things that she can point to as evidence of her arc towards a healthier place. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I mean, this idea that like 
that, that's kind of the idea that like you should like you should value the progress you've made. Yeah. It, not not chasing the the ideal. It seems in line with what Jessica was saying, where it's like, look, like I you you I I, I can see a good future for you the way you are now. And, yeah. and Sveta just kind of like literally just like shaking her head as 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 Jessica's talking. It's like, yeah. no, but really, like, like it could just get better and better and better, you know. But yeah, yeah. Uh, to to be fair to Sveta, I don't think anyone is quite fully able to understand what every second of every minute of every hour of every day of her life is, and right. how, how that 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 feeling that we started the chapter on that 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 she's constantly on the edge, over the edge, right. Um, holding a baby and is about to drop it. So yeah. it, it's difficult for anyone else to fully understand that. And that's something that, that as, as everyone said in their answer, that that's something that only Sveta knows. Yeah. Yeah. And last, but certainly not least, we have Kerpop 42 who thinks that Sveta should probably go through with it, but points out that these kind of things could be a potentially slippery slope. Victoria going to bow is while, in while she's she's in adjacent headspace to we should become dictators she's in that headspace while she's choosing to go to bow while she's still willing to compromise on her morals and get better results if sveta signs off on victoria's compromise more compromises are in the future yeah this idea that like okay we worked with the 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 monster and it worked out yeah so maybe we'll work with more monsters tomorrow yeah right the the tyrant only asks um for your firstborn child now <laughs> yeah no i i like that that's that's yeah. great yeah so that was all the answers to the discussion question great answers everyone i like to see that there was there was really a mix there were some people said yes absolutely some people said no um some people said they honestly just weren't sure yeah cool yeah. Uh, we did have something just generally discussed in the thread that I wanted to bring up. Uh, Placid Platypus touches on a part of the should Victoria warn dragon part of last week that we didn't mention. They say uh, Tattletales read is that it might hurt our protagonists, but could possibly help the situation as a whole. Victoria, being a hero, decides that it's worth it. And they read Lisa going alone, going along with it as more of a matter of trusting Victoria's heroism than trusting her decision making. So I don't think that's something we specifically said that part of the read was, well, it could hurt you specifically, but might help everyone. And Victoria's like, OK, I'm willing to do that. Mm. Um, I, I like that. I like that. That, that yeah. actually scans better than what I had kind of interpreted. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that, Placid Platypus. I always like to see different reads like that. It's really cool. Yeah, especially when they just kind of unseat my current read. <laughs> uh, so new discussion question for this week. And the question is uh, as follows. Both Ward and Worm have circled around the central idea that pretending to be someone for long enough can result in a person changing into the thing they were pretending to be. Discuss a character you feel best exemplifies this idea. So I, I like it. Cool. I look forward to your answers everyone yeah yeah me too i think that one has a lot of um a lot of potential uh, yeah I, that's that's my it's one of my favorite kinds of questions is go do a deep dive on a character come back to us yep and that's all we got for you this week on we've got ward you guys are all part of this show now so feel free to provide us with advice thoughts questions on this week's reading i feel like we can take the now away from you're all part of the show yeah because... I, I think we did i think i literally just slipped back into <laughs> saying it <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're right. That was when we switched over to the new format after uh, after we finished Worm, which was uh, almost a year and a half ago. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Um, you could reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or over on our Twitter account at gotwormpod. That is, of course, where I do my weekly live reads of the chapters every week. Um, it's also where you can find any updates about our show schedule, when the episodes are coming out, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Ward, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find all the other shows we do along with this one at our website, doofmedia.com. It's where you can find Deep Impact, Vow to View, The Doofcast. <laughs> it's a nice little website. You should check yeah, it out. It is. And check if, it out. Yeah, if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, consider donating to our Patreon account, patreon.com slash doofmedia. You can donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Supporting us on Patreon gives you tons of great bonuses like voting in our quarterly fan art and costume contests, Q&A sessions, access to live streams of our recording sessions, and our excellent Discord chat. This week, we're giving special thanks to new bidoofs, uh, Al, uh, sorry, David H. and Adam M., the Blue Hedgeroo, 
and Luke H all at the one dollar level. Thank you so much. Um, really cool. Um, and we'll see you on the Discord. We appreciate y'all. Yeah, thanks, guys. And as always, make sure you go over to Wildbo's Patreon, patreon.com slash Wildbo, and donate to him as well. This is his world. We're just playing in it. And if you cannot afford to donate right now, that is absolutely okay. You can instead help us out by uh, voting for this book on that top web fiction thingy. Vote for that book, and then more people will find it. And then once some more people find it, they'll find us, and then everybody wins. That's true. Yeah. But that thing does exist. Yeah. <laughs> you can also head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. We don't have any new reviews to we- read this week either. It's two weeks without a new review. You're breaking my heart, everybody. Um, so please send in those reviews. They really do help new people find our show. And we like reading them. It makes us feel, it makes us, our heart warms. It does. We've got to count the win. Uh, that's it for this, for this week's show. Next week on the show, Breaking Breakthrough Breaks into Teacher's Break Room. I wrote that for you, Matt. Did you like it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. 